Welcome back to the Free Code Camp podcast. I'm Quincy Larson, teacher and founder of FreeCodeCamp.org. And each week, I'm bringing you insight from developers, founders, and ambitious people getting into tech. This week, I'm joined by the legendary and prolific Andrew Brown. He's a CTO turned co-founder of ExamPro.co. He started the exam prep website with another guy named Andrew, who's also from Canada, who also loves Star Trek. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I just want to point out that uh, even though it's .co, we have the .ca. It just doesn't sound as uh, as nice when you say it. So Yeah. Yeah, well, um, it's such a cool website. You've got so many resources on there, and uh, you've shared those resources so abundantly with the global developer community using Free Code, Free Code Camp as a conduit for helping people prepare for various cloud certifications, you know, your AWS certifications, your Azure certifications, Google Cloud, uh, even like a lot of the, uh, like, uh, I guess, more advanced, like Kubernetes certifications, things like that. Uh, so it's so cool to finally have you on the podcast after knowing you for like six years, uh, collaborating on all these amazing courses. Yeah, and I think I just showed up one day and I said, uh, you have to publish this course. <laughs> I, had this, <laughs> I had this big course, uh, like, I like I always wanted to make free content, um, and you know when we first started out, I was I was pressured into uh, monetizing it, which I really didn't want to do, um, and so I had to I had to do that and fail, and luckily that failed, which was great, and so then I was able to take these giant courses that would not normally be free and make them free, which is which is really exciting. Yeah, yeah, we're all about free, and uh, I just want to take a moment to thank the eight thousand five hundred sixty two kind folks around the world who support free code camp our charity each month by donating some amount of money to our charity and uh, these donations are a huge help and they make programming like this possible they make it possible for me to work full-time on free code camp and for uh, like nearly three dozen other folks engineers teachers around the world to also focus on creating free learning resources for everyone so thanks Thanks to everybody. And again, thank you to Andrew for just supporting Free Code Camp through this amazing wealth of learning resources that you share. Uh, I, I mean, it seems like you publish probably five or six courses a year at least. Like, it's, it's amazing how quickly you develop, like, updated, like, the, the moment one of these certifications updates, uh, it's like you're right there. Right. Or the moment a new certification launches, we'll talk about like the GitHub certifications in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that was fast. Yeah. yeah. The moment it comes out, you're like there with uh, with your camera out, like ha having already passed the exam, ready to like explain exactly how people can you know pass. these. Like you've passed. I don't know. How many certification exams do you think you've passed in your career as a you know prep, you know, instructor? I, I don't know. Like it's. At least, like at least 30 at least 30 uh, unique unique certifications and you know what's really weird is like i actually have to fail them now because what i learned was that um if i pass them i can't take the updated exam ah. so like i have to go in and then i have to fudge them but sometimes i end up passing and i'm not supposed to but i just like want to so <laughs> <laughs> do you know what i mean like i'm just like i'll pass it but uh yeah i don't know it's just um uh, after you do so many, it, it becomes uh, trivial. So, which yeah. is a good thing, right? If you put the time in, you can do anything. Yeah, the mob boss is telling you to throw the fight, but you're just like, oh, I gotta pass it. I can't hold back my knowledge of cloud. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so cool. Well, before you were a uh, exam, you know, expert uh, in in passing all these different cloud exams. Of course, you worked as a CTO, but before that, you had kind of a family business around computer repair it still it, exists okay awesome maybe oh, yeah. you can tell us a little bit about like your humble origins as somebody repairing computers and working with your family on this you know our family business came about because uh, you know my mom she was in uh, uh was a system administrator for or just at, at the admin for bell in our in our hometown so bell uh, bell canada which is uh, a telecom company they had um, a large presence in our our town and is, so she is, managed is it related to like at&t American I don't know. Telegraph and Telephone. So I, they had like the the southern southwestern bell was the Texas and Oklahoma uh, phone company. They got broken up into a whole bunch of different baby bells. 
So it, um, it's possible that there was, it was like a Canadian, you know, I've, I've seen like I've seen like Bell and AT and T. I thought Bell was Canadian because I thought Alexander Bell was Canadian. But um, for what I again, I I don't know the logistics of it. But all I know is that we had a, a large presence of Bell in uh, I'm in Ontario in, in Northwest Ontario, and so um, they had uh, they they had new ownership um, and they built a big expensive building. It turns out that was too expensive. And so then they down, downsized the uh, one in her hometown. And my, my mom didn't want to move to Toronto. She wanted to stay up north with her family. Um, and so uh, she took all the skills that she learned from uh, being an administrator and then went into computer repair. Um, and so that was the entrepreneurial business. And so that's where I was fixing computers. And um, I transitioned from there doing uh, tech education. So I, like I've been doing it forever. Um, where I would go on site and I would train train people at their homes on their computers. Yeah, well, that is so cool. First of all, I had no idea that Alexander Graham Bell was Canadian. I think you learn think something new every day. And uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, yes, Bell Canada divested from AT and T. I'm not sure what exactly that means. I, maybe they were involved in at t at some point. Anyway, this is not the corporate history podcast. This is the <laughs> learn to code podcast, but still it's, it's, it's cool. So, um, so that's cool. Your mom was a sysadmin early on. And, uh, so maybe you can talk about like the day to day, like, did they start the company while you were still a kid? Were you able to work there when you were a kid or like, how old were you when you got your first job? I remember, uh, I think it was like 95 or 96 was when uh, my mom opened uh, the business. Uh, and so, I mean, as it really is like 15, 16, I was, I was there. Because it started, it started at our, at, in our house, in, in our basement, right? Um, and so we had computers there. And then she got an office. And, uh, you know, I just, I just love computers. Like, I, I was always on computers. And... Um, you know, I was always trying to, to help my mom, wh whether it was writing word per word perfect macros, mm -hmm. doing PowerPoint presentations, uh, anything, right? And so, um, you know, I just became really good at uh, web technologies and things like that. And so, you know, she was giving me work because she was getting referred to build websites and other things like that, and she didn't know how to do it. Um, and so I took on that work and then she, because I was good at doing that and that was not causing any issues. I was allowed to then fix computers and, uh, do repairs and things wow. like that. Mm -hmm. So, so just from creating simple macros for Microsoft word, you, you gradually progress. And so it sounds like you had like an early love of computers and technology. I, f what, I used to be, I used to go take uh, college courses like when I was 10. So like, I like, just like if it was computer, or anything would be like, we're going to do the whole, Microsoft Word Suite, or and I, like, and I just wanted to go do that, and I would, and I'd be like so excited to do word processing, or or anything like it, it like it was on Photoshop or whatever. Uh, as a kid, that's that was my extra uh, extracurricular activities was was doing that kind of stuff. Um, so I had like college certificates when I'm like ten or twelve for random <laughs> technologies. Yeah, that's so cool. So. Sounds like very early on, did you, would you say you envisioned yourself working with computers for the rest of your life? Like, was there a specific point where you were like, yeah, this is what I do. This is who I am. Or was it just kind of a gradual progression? Uh, I, I, I just think it was just like that fascination of it. I mean, yeah, there's the aspect it was the family business. And so like my brother fixed computers and I fixed computers, but, um, and my, my two sisters worked at the company for, for a while, but, uh, it just seemed like that was what I was destined to do because it was the trade of, of the family. Yeah. Well, what were some of your earliest memories of using computers? Like, what were some, were there any inflection points where you're like, they just pulled you in deeper? Like, I remember, I, I often talk about Nintendo.com, their chat room, and like talking to different people and realizing, hey, I can use HTML to like change the font size, and it'll change the font size for everybody. So I'd like troll people by making the font really large, um, because it was just such a poorly built, like, you know, chat room system from like 1994, <laughs> 1995. Like, do you, do you remember like any sort of like moments that just pulled you in deeper into technology? I mean, like I remember playing Carmen San Diego, and I was really obsessed with that. It was like I think like ninety two. Like I was like probably five or six, and yeah. I just I loved playing Carmen San Diego, and like I learned how to use the the DOS prompt to. I mean, which doesn't sound that crazy uh, now because kids are so uh, t uh, technically um, uh, savvy, 
like even even young kids i would say but like i knew how to work ms dos to to get into any program that i wanted to um and i don't know it was just the fascination of of uh, i guess video games or that interactivity like the op like the opportunity that you could do with it right yeah yeah, one hundred percent. Carmen San Diego, they have a new version of the show on Netflix that my kids love. They watch it in Chinese for Chinese. They practice. have a new version. Yeah, it's pretty good. Like she's like it's like, like with the like they have the map and you run around. And you put the map on like they have the end game map. Is it like the so so it's a, like a show. show? It's not it's not like a game video show. game. So it's game not show, interactive, right? but she's oh. just like traveling around with her like team of like inventors and oh, okay. other people that are like helping her like her computer person like they always have like the giant Vaughn character and like the Q character <laughs> essentially like the person who creates the interesting gadgets uh or the person who knows all this fills Carmen in all of these background information mm. for her mission to go undercover as like a museum you know uh curator or whatever uh crazy stories uh but but it's a really cool show um and and yeah that game was really cool and of course I love the where in the world is Carmen San Diego from the TV show as the, a kid? Yeah, the acapellas, yeah. yeah. The acapella. I, mean, the I always wanted to, rock acapella. There you go. I yeah. always wanted to be on that game show. Of course, it was never going to happen. But um, uh, I don't know. I just always wanted to play that end that end level where they're running around on the map and they they're placing the uh, markers uh, in time. And I really wanted to win the. Uh, it was like a pocket translator. I always thought that would be really cool to have, for yeah. whatever reason. But. Uh, such a cool show and like mm -hmm. such like uh like a celebration of like curiosity and intellectualism in an era that like you know he-man <laughs> smash you know type stuff right maybe this was a slightly later this was like in the 90s well how old are you if you don't mind me asking like what year were you born in 87 87 okay cool so you're like seven years younger than me um so yeah you were you you had like internet and computers like seven years earlier probably in your life than i did uh well, again, because my mom worked for Bell, like we had a connection, right? Like I remember before Netscape and having internet. Yeah. You know, like before, uh, which by the way, I, I love Netscape, uh, Net, Netscape Na uh, Navigator. It was great. Um, I, I mean, I wish Firefox was uh, uh, still holding, holding well as it used to, but it's uh, a different thing these days. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, what did you do from there? So you're working at a family business, of course. Did you dream of branching out and creating your own business did you have like a uh, like a kind of a founder bug so to speak that bit you early on and you wanted to be like your mom and start something uh yeah i i realized i didn't want to create computers forever i i like the idea of building applications programming like may, may, like maybe going to like i thought maybe i wanted to go into video games but i realized that, like at an early age that um that industry uh, they're overworked they're not paid well and so i thought okay I, maybe that's more of a hobby and so um i just got really good i wasn't intentional but i just got really good at websites and web application development and uh, you know for me it was like it it scratched that itch enough and so i just kept running with it yeah and so where did you go from there like getting good is one thing but were you able to do like freelance work oh yeah like um so you know I got all my work through um, uh, a women organization called Pero. So, you know, my, my mom was a woman, uh, woman entrepreneur, and so she knew a bunch of other women entrepreneurs. And so I basically built all their websites. So anytime there was a website to be built, uh, I would build it. I really wanted to build web applications, um, but uh, there was no demand and no understanding of that in my hometown. Uh, I wanted to move to Toronto. I did not have the money, and I was trying to get a job there. I just see, I couldn't even, so I like, I spent, years learning how to build apps and I could do all the work, but, uh, nobody was taking the, uh, the gamble on me. Um, and so, you know, one day I had a client, um, and, uh, she wanted to use this open source uh, technology called Ruby, uh, that was built in Ruby on rails. And, uh, it was an open source project and it just was not in a great state. And so at the time Twitter was starting to kick around and it was like 2008 or something. Mm -hmm. Um, I, yeah, early Ruby on rails project. Not not the uh, best example of Ruby on Rails' capabilities in that it had like the fail whale and would frequently crash, but but yes. <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, they uh, this open source project, um, you know, I I knew I knew how to fix it up, and so I just said, hey, this is not a great application for what you want to do, uh, and so I put two weeks of effort, not not being asked, because, uh, but I just started uh, working on it. 
Um, and that co the, the founder of that company decided to hire me remotely and, and then moved me to, to Barcelona where I became the CTO of that company. Wow. So, so for years I was like stacking my skills, but like, I just couldn't get work at, like I would go and take a Greyhound bus all the way down to, from Thunder Bay to Toronto, which was like a, well, I don't know, like 16 hour ride each way or something ridiculous. And I would go for one day to go in Toronto to go to like a meetup. Um, uh, just to be around other people that were working with more advanced technologies and to try to get an opportunity. But, you know, places just did not want to hire me because I wasn't local. Yeah. Wow. And this was obviously like decades before the remote work, I guess, acceptance, before employers accepted that you didn't have to be sitting in a cubicle somewhere where they could come in, mm -hmm. you know, ask you to come in on Sunday <laughs> or whatever, no. whatever the, the, you know, office space thing is. Um, yeah. The, so... Barcelona. This is not like Barcelona, Canada. This is like Barcelona, Spain. Yeah, like Barcelona, you Spain. Moved to, yeah. To, you moved to Europe. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Uh, uh, I, I did really well there because um, in terms of technology, they were always like two, three, year, two, three years behind building what was already built in North America. So it's like they're building it for their market, right? It's like, and all we were building was a project manager. It was a competitor to, to um, Basecamp. Um, so... Uh, and I, I mean, back then, I would have loved to work for Basecamp, but uh, again, of course, uh, no opportunities there. So yeah, I worked on that, and that was uh, uh, really good. Um, and then from there, I just went to a string of startups because I just became really good at um, rapidly building applications and standing them up. Uh, and so I would find uh, like startups that had seed or pre-seed money, and I would come in, and I would help them close their round and build their deck and hire their hire their first engineers and scale them to whatever their goal was, whether it was like 200,000 to 500,000 users. And I was really good at it. Um, but that, but I was never like really cut in in the same way of the original co-founders because I wasn't right. there on day zero. So they, they, I just never had the same um, opportunities. Yeah. And so I, I grew, I grew uh, tired of that, not being able to, um, uh, not having the same negotiation skills to, uh, to to make the money, but putting the work in, and so then I decided to just do my own firm and just make more money. Yeah, that's so cool that like you got to be on the ground floor of all these startups, even if you weren't getting like the founder level of equity. Which for anybody who's not familiar with like how startups work, I'll just give a very 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 quick highfalutin. You know, uh, but basically you have two or three people that come together. Sometimes one person, like a lot of big projects don't have co-founders. They just have one person starting them. But uh, then the founders divide up their equity and then they have like, a lot of times they'll have like, they're like 20% for early hires and then 20% for everybody else basically. And the founders will keep, you know, like 30 or 40% depending on how well they can negotiate with investors. Um, so you're not getting the founder equity of like 10% of the company or something like that, 20% of the company you're getting like 1% as like an early hire, maybe 2%, right? Something like that. Well, well, well in my situation, I, like I was getting a large percentage, but um, like it'd be 10 or 15%, but there oh, was really? like, yeah, but there's strings attached where it's like it invests over this period. And yeah, and there's like a cliff. It was the cliff. And you know what they would do? They, uh, it happened twice to me where it, where it was like they, because I was the most expensive employee with the, the large amount of shares and like if they want to raise another round, they want to claw back that stuff. And so- they like I got let go one like one time and the other time it's just like I don't know the point was is that startups are are very tricky and uh, you have to be very good at advocating for yourself and making sure you're looking out for yourself because these it's all about money right yeah and uh, at the end of the day it's like if you leave yourself open for people to take things away from you they will uh, and it's just the nature of that uh, of that industry unfortunately so yeah I mean it's I a mean, zero sum you know like every percent that we don't have to give to Andrew Brown we can keep for ourselves well, it's, that kind of uh, I, and people get really weird about money I, uh, I mean I think I think it's also hard because it's like you know I don't think people are always trying to be a bad person but just like it can mess with your mind uh, or justifications uh, uh, um, tap in but if you ever seen the show Silicon Valley yeah. It was like that. That's what it was like. It yeah. was like that and every every day. It was just it was a little bit too wild for me. But uh, yeah, you just have to have a, a lot of luck and um, and uh, negotiating skills and things like that. Yeah, I have a lot of friends who are startup veterans 
who started watching Silicon Valley and stopped because they were like, this is giving me like flashbacks of like yeah. horrible experiences. <laughs> yeah, for years it's I wouldn't real. watch it. Yeah, for years <laughs> I wouldn't watch that show. It's just like I, was, I couldn't take it. But so now it's now it's fun. Um, yeah. I think the, I think the industry is in a different place, but that was just the time and place how it was. So yeah, well, time heals all wounds, right? Like uh, it, you could probably go back and watch it now and laugh about it. You know, yeah, yesterday's so. tragedy is today's comedy. Uh, not in all circumstances, but in some certain circumstances for sure. Uh, so yeah, that that is a show like dec- definite recommended viewing for anybody who wants oh, to work yeah. in tech. Uh, yeah. It just highlights the absurdity of zero interest rate. You know, crazy. You know, venture capital funded growth and like incompetence at the incumbent players that are being disrupted by the newcomers and all this stuff. It, it, so all those different dynamics you get in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, like the kind of the Mecca of tech, so to speak. Like, uh, and, and Toronto of course has a pretty, pretty good developer scene as well. Right. Oh um, yeah. For, for Canada. Yeah. It's, yeah. um, uh, uh, fin, fintech, uh, health tech, uh, it, for some reason, ML has always been, I mean, I'm sure everybody thinks they're an ML hub, but like, yeah, uh, the, ML has been a heavy focus for, for years for Toronto. Yeah. 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 And ML of course stands for machine learning, which is what powers all the AI products that are coming out. Uh, so, wow. So you did this kind of like rent a CTO type, uh, <laughs> basically approach, yeah. hey, uh, where everybody money. brought you in, you were the fixer, like, like a bunch of biz business guys who don't know very much about technology they they're able to get funding but they don't have the chops to actually build and ship so they bring in you the fixer the 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 server whisperer well, yeah um, I, mean, I, I mean like the thing was it was more like it was like i mean they thought what they were doing was they were uh, working to like it was contract to hire so they're like mm-hmm. we want to call you cto we want you to be cto we want to give you shares and i'd be like no i don't want shares just give me money just give me yeah. money, and and if things go really well, then maybe I'll think about it. But you know, for me, I was I was just stacking money at that point, and uh, like I had a different co-founder at the time, and and that's uh, what we were doing because we wanted to bootstrap something we really wanted yeah. to do, right? So we wanted to build like a product, like a, a tech product, or I always wanted to do tech education, but it wasn't the interest of my uh, previous co-founder. Um, and it's just we were never getting there. It was just like we were just building thing after thing and we're building up this team of a firm with developers and i'm just like i don't like doing this i don't want to keep building projects for other people that i don't believe in uh, even if it makes really good money and so yeah. we had to talk and and we said it's time to do something different yeah and i just want to like highlight what you said there like just give me money i don't need stock options like a lot of companies will give stock options as a form of incentive and stuff and it, it, you know if it's like a big public company that you're working for like Walmart or Amazon or something like that. It's, it's almost kind of like free money in the sense that like th- you are going to be able to liquidate those stock. But it, certainly in the U S if you get a bunch of stock from like a company like Uber and Uber just takes forever to go public, they, they might have like this, like there were a lot of people who worked at early engineers at Uber who, um, by the way, super pumped documentary shows you just how evil that company was. And the the <laughs> yeah. evil genius of Travis Kalanick, uh, of course, played by uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I strongly recommend people watch that show. Uh, I think it's on Netflix. Um, yeah, super cool show. Just showing you how Machiavellian, like if you don't care about the rules and you just break all the rules, like uh, it, it was like, it's definitely like watching like Breaking Bad where you're like, almost rooting for the bad guy, but you know he's so bad and you feel so guilty for like empathizing and like wanting him to win. But anyway, uh, a lot of people at Uber had like millions of dollars worth of shares that they couldn't exercise because there was no exit. And there was like this sunset, the lock-in period, or I can't remember what it's called, but basically you have to exercise your options. And if you don't exercise them before this date, then, and, and, but at the same time, you have to pay a whole bunch of tax whenever you exercise those options. So there were people who like literally didn't have the cash on hand to get millions of dollars worth of, you know, theoretical gains that they would get once Uber eventually went public. And of course it did go public, but we didn't know at the time when that was going to happen. So people would have to be like going out and borrowing a whole bunch of money to pay off the tax liabilities for exercising these options, buying a bunch of Uber that might never actually be worth anything. So a lot of people just walked away from their Uber shares because of that. Um, So, you know, when in doubt, just take money <laughs> because well, uh, you're concentrating your risk, right? You're already working for the company. So your month to month livelihood is tied up in that. And 
you know, companies may be like, show how much you believe in the company, buy a bunch of, you know, like if your employer is ever trying to sell you equity in, in their own company, like I would definitely be like concerned. Uh, I mean, it's a nice to have, but it's not, not to, not to, uh, uh, um, uh, displace what you should be paid. I, yeah. And so, you know, like, it's not like it's bad, but it's just like, if you don't have the, the, the finance sense to make sense of it, I just, I still don't, yeah. I'm just terrible at it, that I just like, forget it. Let's not do that. Uh, yeah. let's, let's do what we, we know it's going to work. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I just got away from startups and like my company, I don't call it a startup because we don't have any, uh, investors. We don't want investors. We don't want to get acquired. Um, there's no, it's just like, we just want to keep it going and build a large catalog for free stuff. And yeah. that's, that's the goal, right? Like, yeah, once you take investor dollars, you're strapping kind of a time bomb to your back. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's like, the, have you ever seen the movie speed with Keanu Reeves? Like the, if the bus drops below 50 miles an hour, it'll explode and kill all the tourists on board and all the working moms and everybody that's on the bus. So they're all trapped on this bus. that's like barreling down the highway, the unfinished highway um in la <laughs> like it's, that's probably the most unrealistic thing about it that you would actually be able to move 50 miles an hour in la but <laughs> um but it's like that like once you take on investor money you're expected to keep the bus going 50 miles an hour and if you go up to 60 boom it's like a ratcheting effect like oh you can't go less than 60 that that you have to keep growing you can only move in one direction so i definitely think it's it's prescient and wise for you to eschew uh, investors. If you start a charity like Free Coke Camp, people literally can't invest and you can't own any equity. So it just completely like simplifies a lot of those decisions. One of the reasons I, I chose to make Free Coke Camp uh, a charity and I donated all the equity that I had. I had like, I don't know, like 90 plus percent of the equity. Uh, we didn't ever have any in in investors or anything. So um, yeah, I just donated that to Free Coke Camp for zero dollars when we got our tax exempt status. And uh, yeah, like since then, it's just been really simple. <laughs> we don't have anybody telling us mush, 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 move faster, move faster. And it sounds like you don't have to worry about that either. Who are the yeah. key state? Like other than the other Andrew, the other Trekkie Canadian, uh, who, who else cares about the decisions you all make? Like who else is involved? I mean, we have our small team. Like I, we got Sam, we got Cindy, we got Peter. Uh, we've had other, uh, other, other folks that are here, but we just keep a, a very small, small team. Um, you know, like if there's no need to grow the team, there's, there's no reason to, right? Because it's just stuff that you have to maintain down the road. So like, for instance, you know, like if we start making, uh, more money because there's a popular certification doesn't mean that you should upscale and hire more people because what happens when that deflates, which is kind of like what we saw with COVID or, or other, or, 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 or other organizations like that. Um, so, you know, growth is not important as longevity of the company and making sure that the key people that are here are being taken care of, whether that is making sure they have good health insurance, good, good uh, job security, um, and making sure that, you know, we can make money while also being honest. Right. So like we're, we're, te we're, we're a for-profit, but we operate not very well for profit in the sense that like we make enough. Right. But it's not to the point where it's at the detriment of, of the, the person, like I'm not out here going like, Hey, you have to like you should get certifications and you should get ten certifications um, and try to upsell you. Like I'll be honest with you, I'll be like, hey, I think that uh, this is something you can do and it's very popular and you're going to do it because everyone's telling you to do it. I think there's better ways to do it. I'm going to make the content at least free and have affordable tiers so you can support me. So at least you don't waste your money. Do you know what I mean? Like I just want people to, I just want people that you know get a fair like a fair deal or or as as cheap as as cheap as possible. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, terrible business uh, model. <laughs> that does make sense. It, like, but you're optimizing for longevity. You're not optimizing for having a yacht. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, obviously, certifications are the the key. That's what people want. It's it's kind of like a, a an addition to a university degree. If you have a university degree, or if you don't have a university degree, it's a way of proving competence from some arbiter. Um, objective arbiter, whether that's Amazon or Microsoft or one uh, CompTIA, one of these other organizations that certifies people, it, it, it is like independent verification of your skills. Yeah. Um, and why certifications in 2020 
for? Why are certifications so important in your mind? I mean, um, you know, you know, my, my thought process is that certifications, they, they're a goalpost, so that there's something to work towards, and they're structured learning. Um, I, I would say that I like the idea of certifications. I like the idea of, of it over diploma programs because they can be more agile, uh, uh, more up to date, more practical, closer to what the industry wants. Uh, whereas I think that schools, um, they're under like they, like there's regula there's regulations and stuff like how schools have to operate. And yeah. the, obviously, the reason why certifications came about was because at, like you you go to a comp sci program in my hometown and they're and they're teaching you uh, Perl from nine years ago and they don't ever update their curriculum, right? Um, and then there's this huge process to update it. And so I you know I feel that it's ser service in need. Um, so I, in, in theory, I like the idea of certifications, but um, I think the biggest problem with certifications as of, as of today is that um, these organizations are in a growth mindset. Like as of, like as of today, I found out like AWS laid off hundreds of employees from uh, their training certification team because it wasn't, it wasn't growing, right? Either mon monetarily, whatever stuff. And so we saw uh, like strange behavior for the last six months where uh, we had people like, providing false expectations of what the outcomes of the certifications are. So like they don't guarantee jobs, but they do definitely get you a foundation of skills that are going to be useful. Um, but I, I think there's an issue where you have these organizations and it's not just AWS, all of them, um, where, and not all of them, but most of them, most of them, most of them, where they are, um, uh, they started out good and they were good for a, a period of time. And now they're getting into territory of like, okay, now we're just here to get the money. Um, and so I'm not saying stop stop taking certifications. Like I'm still rolling out like I think like six AWS refreshes, and I still believe in 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 the content. It's just more like align your expectations and think about how it's going to fit in reaching your goals, right? Yeah. So if that makes maybe, sense, maybe we can start like th that's so interesting that you see like changes in the way the certifications are being, uh, you know, essentially put out there, maintained. Like uh, you can't lay off. I think you said hundreds of people. Is it really hundreds of people? They said hundreds. They said between. Um, they said specifically sales and uh, TNC were were the largest cuts. So we don't really what, what's know. What's TNC? How many. Stands for training and certifications. Training and certification. So okay. they're, they're directly involved for making their certs and providing like uh, certifications. They said they're going to move towards um, on demand and work with um, other vendor like uh, third party vendors. But I, they they could call me whenever they want, but uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah those so. hypothetical third party vendors who uh, they're they're so proactive about reaching out to you and involving you, right? <laughs> Not really. Well, well, I I think we saw the other day about um, what was the project? It was uh, FFmpeg where they were saying, yeah. "Hey, you can reach out to us whenever they want." They say, "Well, maybe the channels aren't, you know, like I'm like, no, no, they know who I am. They can reach out whenever they want. There's nothing stopping them." So. So people take it's like you can't speak up or you can't uh, you have to like work a particular way, but it's just sometimes it's just they don't want to for yeah. whatever reason. So yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, one thing I want to talk to you about is just like the various certification, you know, ecosystems, if you will. Like Microsoft has theirs, uh, Amazon, Google. Uh, I think uh, HashiCorp, HashiCorp, Lynx uh, Foundation. Linux Foundation, of course. Yeah, we've worked uh, with them. Who? Maybe you could rattle off like the big players in this space, and um, maybe some of the big certifications. Like, just for the sake of every, like, I did, I'll take notes and I'll add these in the, sure. the notes. Um, I always take notes during these. So if you hear like a little keyboard clatter, it's not me like responding to emails or anything. It's like I am furiously taking notes. I've already got like four pages of notes from talking with Andrew here. So um, yeah, if you could just rattle off like who the players are and I mean, what they specialize in i mean we have tech certification cloud certifications network focus certifications, security certifications those are our broad four categories i think i said four um and so you know when things started when at least like as far as i remember like there were tech certifications like the a plus certification and whatever other comptia certifications and like even back at, at our, like at our family family store back in the late nineties, early two thousands, those things were important. Getting an A plus certification, especially working at a computer store, people yeah. cared about those. Um, we saw other organizations that spun up security certs um, and 
trying to like CCSP and things. I forget the the parent organization, but like their their process for accreditation was extremely uh, involved. Like you had to uh, uh, show that you worked in the industry for so many years, and you had to have another security expert vouch for you. And the exam was broken into separate parts. So like the um, uh, the evaluation process was extremely extremely involved. Uh, but you knew that you were getting uh, very good uh, uh, people. So the cert actually mattered, right? Um, I think for a while people talked about that. They're saying like they didn't like how hard the requirements were. It was considered gatekeeping. So there would yeah. be some relaxing in there. Uh, Microsoft always made certifications for years and years. Um, before they weren't role-based. They were like per, per, um, per technology. And that was good for a, a long time, but they just oversaturated their their library. They used to be very hands on, like very lab driven, um, and it was a really great way to evaluate it. But then uh, they moved away from that, maybe f for cost purposes, or uh, they just oversaturated the market. And everything has now moved over to role based certifications, right? So I think AWS, AWS was so the, role. The... Or an example of a role would be DevOps, yeah. or Site Reliability Engineer, or something exactly like, that. like yeah. a title like that. And so it was AWS that really kicked that off. Um, and uh, for a while, they were they were the leader. Uh, I would say like 20, 2014 to twenty eighteen, they were they were really uh, uh, they they really had this new model of like uh, like the the certificate like the, the the attestment part wasn't as hard. You know what I mean? It was just like a, a multiple choice exam. Uh, the, the content was short like shorter. It was more role based. It made sense at the time. Uh, and then we saw Microsoft. They started uh, moving over to that and. When Google wrote, uh, rolled theirs out, they did that as as well. And so, um, you know, I think for a while, AWS like was was really defining this new new way of, of making certifications. But um, I think as time went on, um, uh, you know, the, the novelty of cloud has worn off. Uh, now we want uh, people with like you, like you're not no one's looking for cloud consultants anymore. Everyone knows how to, like how to work with cloud now. So now they want people with hard tech uh, fundamental skills whether you are a developer or uh, like a, a network engineer or something else, and then applying that to cloud. And so um, the uh, the bar has not raised in terms of that um, testing process. Like we talked about like those security certs that were yeah. heavy hitters. And I think there needs to be an adjustment. Either the expectations of the outcomes of these certifications need to uh, be realized and um, uh, be properly promoted, not to false expectations or the evaluation process has to change so um does that make just sense? to be just to kind of recapitulate what you're saying the tests need, either need to be harder or they need to temper their marketing for what a certification yeah, is exactly. going to help you achieve either one one or the other right because um you know and it's just i would just say it is 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 in the, the 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 hot seat right now whereas microsoft has made some uh improvements like they have some uh, so on select tests, they've made it open book. So like you can go up to look at the documentation while taking the exam. They've brought back some of their labs. Um, Microsoft has been really good about uh, like the Azure exams about actually using the tech. I would just say the only frustration, the frustrating part about doing Microsoft exams is that their services are sprawling. And so in theory, their exams are, are, uh, are well executed. It's just that their technology is a pain, a pain to use. In my opinion, but um, uh, you know, I, I would probably say that Microsoft's doing the best uh, with with their like how they're engineering their certifications and their curriculum, and, and, and the issues they're having is not necessarily the exams; it's more just the nature of of the state of their products because they're so rapid developing, right? Like they're they're out there, and like I just imagine them in a boardroom trying to like get a sale from like a school or, or something else. And yeah. this, uh, they go around the table. And everyone says, has to have this, has to, has, have, has to have that. And they go, okay, it has all that stuff. And then they roll up those products. And so their stuff is a bit more mishap, but it does work in the end. And yeah. that's always been Microsoft forever. Do you know what I mean? So um, it's like a totally different culture from Amazon oh, yeah. in terms of getting things done, even though they're like located just a few miles from one another at their headquarters and stuff. Yeah. But, but it, like Microsoft's fast and loose, but it works. And like, this comes back to like fixing computers. Like we remember, like they would roll out their OS and then you're just like every month you're doing patches cause they're fixing things cause they just won't stop rolling stuff out, but they're meeting the business demands of, of the organizations. And even if it's not immediately, they eventually do. Right. And that's why there's such a juggernaut these days. Yeah. 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 I mean, it is, it's been impressive just how, uh, I mean, considering how much of a lead 
AW's had over Microsoft, just Microsoft coming in really strong with Azure. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an exciting company to watch, uh, to, to see the decisions they make and like analyze them. In terms of, I'm an individual, I want to earn some certifications. Like most of the people probably listening to this are not in control of like a, a giant cloud company trying to like figure out like what a cloud certification strategy might look like. Most of them are on the other side of it. They're devs who want to earn some certifications and want to be able to uh, ramp up their earning power, ramp up their opportunity in terms of being able to get progressively more advanced roles in security or network engineering or uh, you know cloud engineering. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what these certifications can do for you in terms of how they can, you know, help in those regards. I think they lay, I think they lay out a, like a good roadmap in terms of or, or of the landscape of what you need to cover because once you cover something like let's say infrastructure as a code, and you've done it in a few different iterations like Terraform, CloudFormation, whatever, you have that skill, right? So no matter if Alibaba Cloud says, hey, we have a new product, or there's like a spinoff like like uh, HashiCorp, Terraform got forked with Open Tofu, or uh, you know there's some like thing that's like a control plane that's similar to IAC. The, the idea is that you have enough transfer, uh, transferable knowledge to uh, to be dangerous. And I do feel like there there is a certain amount of knowledge you need to gain over a period of time, whether it's three or six years, and every year you can tackle something different. So like even through my career, like, uh, you know, even though I was building apps, like, like, and I was, and I had like a team of developers and, uh, you know, we had like a good amount of, uh, of users and, and traffic or whatever, um, you know, I, I would still have like a, um, uh, like, uh, like blind spots. Like I was just like, wasn't really good at optimizing SQL. And I'm like, this is the year I'm going to spend two, three months and get really deep SQL knowledge. And that never leaves me. It's like early in my career. It's like yeah. I invested that time learning regex. Right. And uh, now I, I get to keep that skill for the rest of my life. Do I remember all the, the details of it? No, but I, I have confidence with it. And I, I feel that every different type of certification, AWS, Microsoft, all the ones that we've been doing they're there's just like they're they're taking they're covering a part of the pie. And so once you've done them, you've done them in a few different iterations you are now equipped to do anything you want to do. Like tomorrow, if I want to be a data, like a data engineer, I can go do it. If tomorrow I want to be an SRE, I can go do it because there's so much overlap of these skills. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, certifications aren't the most efficient way to cover that, uh, that landscape of stuff, but it's all there, right? And so if you just keep chipping away at it, eventually you'll, you'll have all the knowledge and you'll have that mobility. We had, we ran a boot camp for, what was it Terraform? Um, uh, like the Terraform bootcamp recently, yeah. and we used GitHub as the platform. And I, I did something that I didn't do in the last bootcamp was I, I made everyone do pull requests. Um, and wow, I, I did not realize how many how many people like in the tech industry that are like in not necessarily developer roles, but they're in like IT networking or cloud networking or security, like their minds exploded because they didn't realize that they had this huge like missing gap, uh, like just like working with GitHub or like just working with code. Um, and so, you know, there's always these, uh, op like if you can, if you can get good coverage of, of the fundamentals, you're going to be dangerous yeah. no matter what you do. Right. 100%. And yeah. I just want to emphasize, like I, I'll get on my soapbox for a moment. I think every developer, every developer in 2024 should learn the following seven things, at least, you know, dangerous, sure. as, as you said earlier, like, like, you know, the saying is you master the fundamentals. You never really have to come back to them. You've got that foundation upon which you can build other things. You've got all that knowledge that you can use as scaffolding to like branch out and, you know, web in other knowledge into your, uh, into your kind of like mind map. <laughs> Sorry, I'm mixing all kinds of metaphors there, but I tell everybody you should learn, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, Linux, Git, and SQL. And I tell people like, if you learn those seven technologies, like uh, you're gonna basically, you're, you're gonna have at least two scripting knowledge languages that you know that are very different in their application of different tool ecosystems and stuff, Python and JavaScript. But you're also gonna know databases. You're also gonna know operating systems. You're also gonna know version control. And then HTML, CSS are just convenient to know because you never know when you're gonna need to build a quick user interface and everything like, like even like Electron, I was talking with Jessica Lord who helped 
who founded the Electron team at GitHub. Like every desktop app that like you launch probably on your desktop these days is probably not everyone, but most of them make use of Electron. And what is that? That's just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript running on a native app, like on Windows or on, on Mac, right? Yeah. Um, um, so there yeah, was so a, uh, I actually have deep knowledge on like implementing Electron apps because it was like 2017, 2018, I built a, uh, one of my favorite video games is um, called um, Tetris Attack for the Super Nintendo. Oh, I it's probably love all, that. It's probably yeah, the Tetris back Attack there, right? or Panel yeah, de yeah. Pawn in Japan. Yep. yep. It's a, it's so, a high-skill game. It's deceptively high-skill. Yeah, so, I, I spend way too much time trying to like get like the, the combo so you're system. Saying, you're saying we could be playing right now. Anyway. Could anyway well, next that, time you and I get together in person, we're going to throw down on some Tetris Attack. I've got it on my SNES Classic. I, uh uh, I, I think I, it might come stock with it or I modded it, but it should. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great um, game. But, uh, so, so, um, uh, uh, there's a discord group where, uh, people play competitively. And so I, I joined, the, I'm not, not as good as they are, but, um, you know, they, they play with emulators, but there's a little bit of delay even with RetroArch, And so, um, I was trying to build a competitor one for the market. There's another one that got built in Python that, uh, beat me out. Um, and I, I got busy. I actually, before I was doing this, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to build a, a competitive game of, of um, Tetris Attack, but then I ended up building this company. Um, and so I, I, learned how, I learned how to read assembly code for the SNES, for the ROM, so that I could figure exactly, like, frame per frame the movements. Because if, the, if it didn't have exact frame per frame per movements, then yeah. they wouldn't competitively play it. And so I was basically cloning that. And I, I built the app in Electron with TypeScript, and it, it worked pretty well. But where I got stuck was um, doing the multiplayer. So I just I, I had an estate where I'm working through uh, multiplayer, and I had to build a simpler Tetris game just to try to figure out the, uh, the latency issues or, like, the miscommunication issues, issues I was having. But that's just sitting there, and it's po postponed indefinitely. It's not done. I, like, it's not canceled. But at some point, I'll come back, yeah. and I'll, I'll finish that game. Oh man, it's just warms my heart knowing that you're like literally trying to recreate <laughs> Tetris Attack in a you know contemporary environment. Frame, maybe net frame, code. frame for frame, yeah. Yeah, and, and with competitive gaming, like uh, probably a lot of people watching this who uh, are in the fighting game community or something like, people literally memorize how much frame every different type of punch in mm -hmm. Tekken has or, or in Street Fighter because like... It all matters. Like you're you're doing all kinds of calculations in your mind to figure out like whether a combo will work, whether it's safe to do a certain move in a certain situation. And with Tetris Attack, like you really have to plan out like it, like your hands have to move really quick and stuff. But also, you your mind has to work really quick. Your eyes have to work really quick. And you don't want to be playing on your original SNES and then jumping on like an online client and have the frame data be even slightly different. Otherwise it completely throws off your game. Right. Uh, and people, people want that authentic experience. There's like what's called classic Tetris on NES. I don't know if you've heard about this, but people are still playing Tetris on NES like 30, 40 years later after the release date. Um, but basically that's the canonical version that everybody plays on the, on the original one player, uh, NES, not the Tengen two player unauthorized Tetris. I have the Tetris uh, movie downloaded. I, I can't wait to watch that, by the way. It's just on my long list of things to do when I have time. But, yeah, like, frames, every frame matters. Every, like, making your emulator, like, especially if it's a competitive game, making it exactly um, how the original game is, is vital, or people just will not give it any time of day, right? That's like table stakes. It is. It has to play exactly the same. But, uh, uh, and I was just thinking, I'm almost at the point where I can come back to that game. So like what, and I had a whole team around it. It was, it was really interesting because I always want to make video games, but if you find the right video game that people want, want to be made, the community will just like materialize. So I had like a, like a, a pixel artist and a person that, uh, that made music and there, it was really coming together. It's just, again, it's like, couldn't get there in time. And, uh, but, uh, I'm almost at a point where I can revisit it. And I just, just as of last week, I was spinning up mono game or ga mono game, mono game, which is a, um, it's an open source, um, engine. Uh, so it's, it's like writing unity code, except that you, if you can, if you, you could port it to any, uh, console and, uh, you don't have to pay any licensing fees. And so I had to brush up on my .NET skills. I was very tempted to, I'm, 
make a C-sharp C sharp course because my C-sharp skills are like really sharp right now. But um, uh, it's just, it's like, it's fun because in tech, it's like whatever I learn is always transferable, right? So, um, you know, I spent all that time learning different programming languages and, you know, one day I'm writing TypeScript, the other day I'm writing C-sharp, another day I'm writing Java. And so yeah. it comes back to those seven core skills. Like you said, JavaScript. The point is just to get started in, in those things. And if yeah. you get started in those seven things, you have all those starting points, you just grow those all up, right? Then you're going to be in really good shape. Um, so even if they, they seem like trivial, it's like HTML and CSS seem trivial. Uh, that, that's not the point. The point is, is that they're your stepping stones to get started, right? Yeah. I mean, um, arithmetic and, may seem trivial, but without it, you can't do any of the higher math, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, or like it's like I wanted to um, like I'm coding a prototype game in mono uh, in in mono game because I uh, I want to learn the engine and figure out the the architecture of how I'm going to build my game before I come back to my swap and pop game. Yeah, and uh, I, while I'm building it, I'm building a shoot 'em up because that's like the classic yeah. that's in the background to you that you have there. Yeah, the shoot 'em up, bullet which hell is shooters. A, so so I'm building a shoot 'em up where it's 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 grocery store theme because I'm always uh, I'm always fighting with grocery stores. And so, um, I have mean, to, can you elaborate? You're always fighting with grocery stores. I, I, I live in, I live in, um, uh, remote towns and, uh, the grocery store here is just like pitiful because they, they can charge more and the product produce isn't great. It's not all their fault because in Canada we have, I don't know if it, the word is, mo uh, uh, monopolies or all, all, uh, oligopolies. Where there's just a few sellers. There's a few. So, so there's like, there's Loblaws and Sobeys and there's, Maybe like a, a one from Quebec. Do you think they natural. collude to keep prices high? Uh, I don't know, but I don't think so. I mean, certain things they do. And certain things like bread. There was the bread fixing uh, scam of, <laughs> of Canada. Seriously. Wow. Seriously. Bread is so, such like, an important staple. Like that's scandalous. Like we talk about white collar crime and stuff, but like pe families rely on bread for literal sustenance. Way back to Rome, way back to Egypt, right? Like that. that is just like, if there's ever something that should be price protected is bread. <laughs> and you know what, you know, you know how much bread I buy per month? Cause I have three young kids, like uh, uh, six, f uh, five, four, and two, something like that. And anyway, <laughs> so like they sandwich bread is like the biggest staple in my house. I wish they would eat rice. They just won't eat rice. And so I literally buy 40 loaves like this big of, of whole wheat bread Every single month, I drive two hours. I just Damn. did a trip just yesterday. That's why we couldn't do the podcast the bread yesterday. Run. I did the bread run, the bread and milk run. And uh, like in town, it sells for $4, almost $5. And it's like half the size. And if I go into to Thunder Bay it, at the whole, whole wholesale club, it's like two eighteen for twice the size. Yeah. And so it adds up, right? And so... I even learned how to like if people are watching my, uh, like on my Twitter, they were probably wondering like why I was so obsessed with making bread the last few months. It's because I'm trying <laughs> to offset my bread costs, and I'm wow. not even kidding. So this is a practice. It's not like some hobby that like rich people get really interested in yeast all of a sudden. It's like literal like this is costing me a fortune. Well, well it's just like I don't want it, like I want to have self sufficient skills, so I don't go to the the local place. And and the, it's like partly their fault for overpricing, but the other thing is like. If you look at if you look at their supplier, like their food comes from Family Foods, which comes from uh, McDonald's Corporation, not like McDonald's the the restaurant, but like McDonald's, the guy named McDonald or something, which then yeah. comes from Sobeys, right? And then they set the prices. So like, there's nothing like if you're a grocery store, you have to get your food from somewhere. It's going to come from Loblaws, or it's going to come from Sobeys, and there's only so much flex you have with price. Yeah, I so mean, like they're passing, they have to pass on some costs, and they have to have some margin for themselves. So yeah. the more middlemen you have, I guess the price of bread just kind of explodes for the end consumer so, along the way. But um, but uh, that's why I'm kind of like that's why I was making a grocery store. Like th th there's two games I I always want to make. It's it's uh, Swap and Pop, which is the uh, Tetris Attack competitive yeah. clone. Yeah, in Tetris Attack you have two blocks. Like you have a cursor and you swap the position of two blocks horizontally. That's, that's it. Yeah, your only form of interaction, right? Swap and that's pop. It. They yeah. pop when you get three or four or three in a row. Vertically so, or horizontally. So, so I want to make that. My other game is I always wanted to make a grocery store simulator, which is like you have like a you have, you open a grocery store and you have to you have to manage the inventory and the employees and the visual layout of the store and then you have to deal with com competing grocery stores because like in Canada, like in my hometown Thunder Bay, there were smaller grocery stores that were doing really well, and the grocery stores kept trying to buy them out. And there was a few where 
like their family owned that I know them and, and the family regrets not selling out because it's like their whole family lost out on a bunch of money because they ran them and they ran the competition out. Right. Yeah. So they, they were growing, they were having multiple stores and then they, now they're back to just one store and uh, you know, it's, it's just the nature of things. So I don't know. It's just, it is what it is, but like, that's, that's my obsessions with these particular things. Yeah, man, there was like a, I think it was like Bloomberg or something, a mall simulator game browser. Oh yeah. There, there's, uh, yeah. Uh, shopping tycoon management. I, I, mean, I can't I remember, but there was this newspaper that put together this this really cool, like it had pixel art and chiptune music and everything, and it was like a simulation of what it's like to run a mall. And of course, it's like a nightmare because it's basically um, like your tenants are having to move out because malls are not profitable. And this was all pre-COVID, of course. Uh, okay. So there's like even a subreddit like dead malls or abandoned malls or something where people like break into these like, you know, malls that have basically been like condemned. And like explore and splunk around in like the mold covered, you know, old movie theaters and stuff is they wear like hazmat masks and stuff when they go in there. But uh, yeah, like definitely I, I can definitely see that being a terrible business to be in <laughs> in 2024 and making a game about the plight of grocery store owners would be really cool just from like a kind of uh, anthropological perspective and also from an nostalgia perspective because I worked in grocery stores like I uh, I oh, didn't yeah? have like a cool mom. Uh, I mean, my mom's very cool, but she didn't run like a cool, you know, business where I could be fixing computers and stuff. Uh, I, I would go to the grocery store all the time as a kid and like check out VHS tapes. And then later I worked for like two years at grocery store. Like I'd show up at 6 a.m. and like mop the entire floor. And then I'd go stock and face the shelves and uh, put all the big cardboard boxes into the trash compactor and yeah. try not to get my arm caught in there. <laughs> so I didn't have some like childhood industrial accident, you know, like, um, I have a lot of nostalgia for just walking around and hearing like, you know, Kenny G or whatever playing and, and like the, the fluorescent bulbs above. So I, I would definitely play that game if you make it. <laughs> well, there's just so many, I just, there's just so many systems that you can think about in there. Like what happens when you introduce self checkout? What yeah. happens when there's like an event like COVID? What happens when there is a competitor? Think about like uh, every person that goes through that store, like how far do they live to the store? Uh, like all the, all the attributes of those of, of those people and simulating yeah. that. At, at, like I, like when you go to a grocery store, where you put food matters. So like there's a there's an optimization where it's like there's food at the eye level of like there's a, what at the eye level of kids. Like you put stuff that they'll catch yeah, their attention. Yeah, that's where you put the sugar cereal. Right, serious like the stuff that you like that's cheap that would save people money, but you don't want to buy. You put it on the bottom shelf. The most ex expensive stuff that is like luxury, you put on the top, and then like there's like the 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 one that's just right below there. Like there's all these little optimizations. You go yeah. into the grocery store, you smell flowers, you feel like oh everything smells good. Then you see the produce, you go everything's fresh. Then you go to the bulk, you're like oh there's good deals. They have bulk stuff here. There's yeah, and so even like much pricing involved. and everything too is like a huge deal because. You know, you can put everything half off or whatever. You can get a membership card. Like, uh, then yeah. the people that are not members will be all cranky. They have to pay like six bucks for a little thing of Greek yogurt instead of paying like four, four fifty or something, right? Um, but uh, so you're like pushing people into your, to your rewards program. Also, like one thing that I have no idea if this had an impact, but if you think about cigarettes, right? Like, oh yeah, uh, cigarettes were a massive they're industry. huge to some extent they're they huge, still are yeah. in the united states and probably in they're, canada they're big and, up here they're like remote towns they're huge right <laughs> i mean think about everyone it. Like, smokes yeah they don't really perish like cigarettes are fresh i guess <laughs> as fresh as like a cancer stick can be for like probably at least two or three years you can probably have that carton and it's still consumable right and you have this little carton that costs like 20 bucks or however much cigarettes cost these days and uh it's like 20 or it's like 10 packs and it barely takes up any space. It's very lightweight. It's probably super easy to transport. And that was probably like a huge cash cow for grocery stores in like the 60s, 70s, 80s. Because you've got all these people that are addicted that smoke like an entire pack a day. And they're just coming into your grocery store. And it's a reason to get people to come back into your grocery store regularly too. I mean, like selling milk, the margins on milk and bread are not nearly as high as they are on like cigarettes and stuff like that. So I imagine that's also decimated. This is total speculation, by the way. And and thank goodness that the, the tobacco industry is in decline. I'll just say I'll just share this anecdote. Camel cigarettes 
when I was a kid and, you know, I made bad decisions. Like I smoked camel because Joe camel, you know, the cool, like James Bond of uh cigarette mascots. Right. And, yeah. uh, so cool. Yeah. Camel cigarettes, just that brand alone, 6 million dead Americans, 6 million people who died prematurely before their time because of camel. So yeah, if there's ever been an evil industry, it like no question, like the most evil industry ever was the cigarette industry. Anyway, I'll, I'll end that little, uh, that little soapbox thing, but, so. but it just blows my mind. Like there was, it, it had to be like a bonanza, like the, the input costs, it, it had to be like the greatest industry of all time. <laughs> uh, in terms of just like how little work needed to be done and how much money was like enjoyed by the people who were, I guess, putting those products out there uh, and how little of the cost was actually borne by the companies and how much of it was borne by society in the form of tax that we have to pay to help people who have like 50 pack years or whatever uh, year of smoking cigarettes. It's called a pack year that have accumulated like all these chronic diseases or, you know, even, uh, you know, lung cancer. Anyway, sorry, this is not a public health podcast, but I just felt like talking about that because for me, it's like therapeutic to talk about the fact that like I got taken in by this industry and like there was like a year or so that I, a year or two that I was smoked uh, as a, as a kid, like as a like, young teenager, like 13, 14 years old, 15 years old. Right. And um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I hope, I hope you never smoked and I, I, I hope that none of our kids oh, no. ever smoke. I mean, I worked in a bingo hall for years, but like that was the closest you could say I smoked. But uh, no, it's uh, no asthma. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not okay, smoking well, for anything, right? You dodged um, a bullet with your asthma. <laughs> I hope your asthma is okay. Sorry, I don't want oh, to make light of that. Yeah, that's fine. But yeah. um, you know, like building these games aren't a waste. They've always, they've all, like any pro passion passion project I build, I've always been able to turn into work. So you know, um, Markety, which was one of my earliest applications I built, I, I flipped into like my earliest uh, like uh, uh, contracts because people wanted something similar of what it was like uh, swap and pop that game in particular, which is interesting. I was just building it for fun, but uh, you know, I, I had worked at a previous um, ed tech startup and um, you know, I left, I left and I had interviewed at other ed tech startups in Toronto that were education, yeah, education focused. And, you know, some of them, I came pretty close to getting hired, but uh, um, uh, you know, they, they passed for whatever reason, but like I took that project, that swap and pop, and there was like an organization that was an, uh, that was an ed tech company and they would have hack and tells and you go there and you show off your, what you do. Hack and tell. And, so it's like, and tell. like show and tell, but hack something together. And tell. yeah. So you'd say, Hey, look at this cool project. This is how I built it. And they walk, you walk through the technical stuff. It was just, it was, it was a guise for hiring for this tech company um, because they, uh, they would give you an award, right? Like a gift certificate or whatever. Um, but they, really what they're trying to do is hire the best talent. And so I, I'd show this project and I, like, I, like I won hands down because who's, who's like going through and breaking down assembly code for a, a super Nintendo game to make frame by frame stuff built in an electron app with whatever, like talking about like why TypeScript's good and working with teams. I didn't, I didn't realize like when you're building a game and you have like four or five other people working on it, it's like, you need to know where everything is. It's not yeah. the same as building web apps. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, 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 they wanted to approach me and hire me. I said, you already had the chance to hire me. You weren't interested. <laughs> But yeah. it's just like, but it's just like how much of a magnet that project was, um, and so, like any project, like if, even if I was like building this simulator for, let's say I was building a simulator for a grocery store, like you, you have to, like I'm basically building. Uh, there's software out there for inventory management and stuff like that for grocery stores. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm basically building that stuff. Um, so I always find that you can flip that into work, and that's a great way of, you know, whatever you're building, like. And if people are worried about AI, I'm not really worried about it that much. Like large companies should be like people working in large companies like AWS, Google, whatever, should like should be worried because they they know how to utilize it and streamline their uh their uh their workforce to best utilize it. These small companies don't. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So there's still lots of opportunity for work. There's some there's some people out there saying like, Oh, I, I cut back on my customer support. Okay, but they're not cutting out their tech roles. Do you know what I mean? So um, and what is it Devin? They, is Devin the thing that Devin, knows how yeah, to... yeah, I keep hearing about it, but I, I think a lot of it's probably grassroots, uh, well, or, uh, or, um, what's it called? Astroturfing, like people pretending to be developers, like overstating it. There's so much hype out well, there. But, but My the goodness. thing is what percentage they said, like, there's like, they said there's a percentage of like that 
it was a percentage that they said that they could complete tasks that, like GitHub issues. And so it was like 13.9 percent. I'm just like, okay, but we need a hundred percent and then some. Yeah. So even even if they got a hundred percent, it still doesn't matter. And a lot of those tasks um, are probably just like updating the copyright date in the footer and stuff like that, like simple stuff that like you and I could probably do with our eyes closed. That uh, yeah, it's cool. It's definitely helpful that these tools are out there. But I feel like everybody's just swept up in so much hype. We could we could talk about this for a long time because like I I, I you know li like I listen to like interviews with like you know AI luminaries and stuff like that, and they're like, you don't need to learn to code anymore. I'm like, dude, you're talking your own book. You're basically trying to convince people that your product is like the next thing since the best thing since sliced bread, as we were talking about it earlier. So tie back. Um, it's and, like VR, it's like talking about VR or yeah. Or yeah I mean, it's like. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we will see. But I, I w if I were, uh, you know, somebody getting into code right now, the last thing I would be doing is listening to what, you know, Jensen Huang, the, hey, the that's you know, I'm thinking NVIDIA too, yeah. founder, yeah. telling people, you don't need to learn code anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I don't know any senior developers who are getting work done, who, many of whom use tools like Copilot or have probably tried Devon uh, that, that feel that way. Like, it, it's just... It, interestingly, it's just the people selling the the software that is supposed to be able to replace developers, or people selling the hardware that is supposed to be able to build, you know, train the models that are going to replace the software developers that are talking like this. The actual I mean, developers I, don't feel this way. I mean, like I would I would use it tomorrow if like you'd be you'd see me making courses tomorrow on it if that was the yeah. case. And I'm not saying like it's not worth your time to learn. There's definitely app, it's, there's, there are tools that you can utilize. Yeah, and you use AI tools. I just I want do. to emphasize that. Oh yeah, like, I do a lot. So, <laughs> so one of the things maybe you could talk about some of your tools because first of all, you've been a, a very aggressive and early adopter of AI tools. You know, Bo, who runs the Freeco Camp channel, whom you and I talk with all the time, he uh, he uses Whisper, um, also from OpenAI. To he's working on some scripts to like automatically have really high quality captions in English, which then feed into YouTube's auto translation. So they improve the, the quality of translations. By the way, if anybody's watching this, I really wish I could watch this with Arabic subtitles. You can, you can just click the gear and it's like three or four clicks. They really bury it, switch it to English and then switch to, uh, then once you've switched it to English, like auto generated or English, if there's captions for this, then you can switch it again and you can do auto translate and you can have pretty good, like, uh, I, like we, we did auto translate into Japanese the other day and Yoko on our team, she was watching and she's like, Oh, this is pretty good. Like this is not bad at all considering it's just kind of on the fly translating. But, uh, obviously we're using whisper for that, but like you've used AI, like voice cloning, talk about some of the AI tools you've used. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I think that that's probably the one that sticks out the most, which was the, uh, the, um, the synthetic AI voice. And the reason I had to do that was cause I was losing my voice. Uh, it's called, um, uh, muscle tension dysphonia uh so there's one where it's just like you wear it out and the other ones is like it's degenerative and so like i have de like degenerative voice loss if i keep straining my voice and, and not utilizing it properly it just has to do with uh you know, you know, the predisposition of uh, predis it's just you know genetics right genetics and and uh but anyway the point was is that there was a point where like i could not talk for like six months and i was like well i can't stop making courses and so i i literally went through like I don't know how many uh, like uh, voice products uh, to synth and even try to run my own model to make a synth synthetic voice. And eventually, I, you know, I, I got a voice that worked, but it's not just getting the voice, it's getting the workflow with your technology because like a lot of these things don't make it easy to like type it out and then download the part of it and then sync it up. So we had to um, figure out the right voice that would sync up with our workflow. And then we had to figure out how to, um, there was like another part was like, we were trying to do like, uh, trying to figure out how, okay, we have the voice. Can we do video as well? Cause I hated being on, on screen. Right. Yeah. I just hate, I, I, I found that I would, I would, it would take me like, you know, like 30 second, 15 second video. I make in the beginning, beginning of the, yeah. the things all day, every single time I got a teleprompter. I got everything. It takes all day to do 30 seconds because yeah. I'm, I'm terrible at that. Well, people, um, I think most people are terrible. At, I'm terrible at it too. Uh, which is one of the reasons I, I don't even like use, any sort of teleprompter or anything like that, like for the intros, I just practice, 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 uh, just to try to get it down to when I can do it on my sleep, like the like the baselines. I practice those, I don't know, hundreds of times before I attempt to perform them at the beginning of the uh, the podcast, just because 
uh, being able to perform on the spot, there's always something that you're not completely happy with. Like recording that audio book. I, I wrote a book last year. I recorded the entire thing. That took me like two weeks of like just sitting there with a microphone, reading it, saying, no, I didn't get it right. Let me redo it. And then going back and editing all that. And it's probably twice as bad when you have video just because like maybe like I don't like the way I like delivered that line and I can't just do a nice cut because there's going to be jump in the video too. Right. Actually editing video, it's obvious where the edits are with with sound. You can get away with like less, uh, I guess you can do more editing with sound than you can with sound and video. Back to the eye, like back in 2018 or whenever 26, I always forget when we, our company started, but whenever we started it, like I had an like I already had an AI bot that would, that would, analyze how students would study and make recommendations. Uh, we stopped running that because we needed to rebuild it. And the issue is once we started branching outside of AWS, it became, you needed like a specialized um, model per, like per like family of certifications, right? So, so we had that for a while. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, we were trying to do gen like generate our PowerPoint slides. So like we have a, we have like a huge collection of, uh, like a huge library of slides and there's this huge issue of like when you have to update them, it's like, I was trying to make it so that like, it would generate out the code that I needed and just like make the slides for me. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we're having hundred percent success with these tools, but I'm just saying that we're constantly trying to experiment and try to automate our pipeline so we can stay as small as we can. And we can stand me, the brand, because the yeah. hardest thing in this industry is getting other creators to create content with you at the same, like the same standard, right? So like, I know other people that make great content. It's like, can you make it like me? No, I, I make it my own way. And I, and I have my own curriculum development and I have my own production standards and stuff like that. Um, and, and then it's like, even like, can they deliver the same timeline and stuff like that? It, it doesn't always line up, right? So it's, it's so hard. Um, and you can be dumping money at people and they still, they still like, ah, they get 75% of the way. They're like, ah, it's not for me. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it's, this is a, this is, it's very hard. You wouldn't think it is, but it's very hard to have some of the skill sets and the stuff to do this. And so, you know, I, we made a determination that we're just going to scale me virtually. Um, and it's not to say like we're, we're, we're tricking people because it's still right. me. It's just like, if I can't use my voice. Yeah, We're like you wrote that, every right? word that is being said. It's just that, you know, you, you don't necessarily have the voice to be able to say, and you don't want to spend like an entire day in front of a teleprompter starting over reading. No, a but, you know, but you know what? It's like my, my AI voice, it, you can tell it's not me because I'm, I'm not stumbling or I'm not going <laughs> ums or stuff like that. And so people, people like I, I would say they're getting so good I think I have to generate a new voice because there's a newer model that it was even more realistic. Yeah. Like you would not, you would not know that it was me. Like my older one sound like I have like a mild cold, but like nobody complained. Um, and I'm not like, and I would intermix, I would shoot videos of like where it's, it seems like a little more livelier because now I'm in the video. Right. So like, if there's some really important stuff, you'll, you'll hear me, but it depends on the course, but you know, most, most of the time it's me. Um, uh, but there are, there are some courses that are, um, like we just want to fill out our catalog. We want to get the content out and it's content that would never get made if it wasn't for voice, yeah. because it's just like, I don't, I can't, I can't give my voice to that stuff. So I wouldn't, I just can't, I don't feel like I'm cheating people, but I noticed like YouTube was saying recently that, and I think we talked about this earlier when I first started doing it, I said like, Hey, I should label saying this is a synthetic voice because eventually they're going to ask people to, to do that. And yeah, we, think, we had a discussion with, with YouTube's, you know, team. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, oh yeah. Last week. About this, okay. like, like we don't believe that we should have to label things like that why? are just you know well, like, humans like, that are, that are actual creators doing it. I think like obviously if I'm trying to pretend that I'm some celebrity and like putting words in their mouth that should be labeled, just like you know this contains like AI you know generated speech or something. But I don't think if if I'm using AI, which I've never used it, but I will I will say real quick, I'm very excited about this. There's going to be a voice cloning. Um, course that we're publishing lynn nice. lynn jung on our team who's created like the stable diffusion course and some other things she has taken my uh the corpus of audio from me reading my audiobook and she's created a really good voice model that and i can speak like german i, I can't speak a word of german but you can hear quincy speak you know Wait, flawless are you, german are you, are you saying that they could tra they could do a uh, translation with my tonality and another because yeah like, they can like rap 
they, they the way it works is they build the model and then they kind of like wrap it around like some recorded speech. So if there's like a weather report, they can basically just have me say with the same intonation and everything, but it's my voice instead of you know the, the weather lady's voice. <laughs> I, I've been trying to get somebody, like I, I've been trying to just so many times trying to get people to make like a Spanish version of my course or something. And, and I'll, I'll hand them all the material and they're like, yes, I want to do this, whatever. We'll even pay them. Can't get yeah. it done well, no matter I what. Mean, so Lynn, like, Lynn could help you with that because we have a Spanish free code camp channel. We could definitely publish some of your certs in Spanish. Now, generally like people like to learn from somebody who speaks their course. language, whose culture, it, like but they're never making it. So what's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like it's true. It's, I mean, it's a matter of long time. It's, it's a matter. It's, it's not a matter of like, I wouldn't give it to somebody else. It's like, like yeah. look at my boot camp. It was a hundred hours. Who's going to translate that? Who? Nobody. Who? Nobody. You're right. Nobody. Like, right? It has, there is some work that just has to be done by machines just because humans ain't got time for that. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> and you know, like originally, like I was going to, I was going to learn Spanish. Like, like I used to live in Spain. So I had yeah. some, some level of competency in Spanish. And so I was going to go and brush that up. And everyone's like, oh no, no, don't do that. And I was like, but why not? No, no one will do it for me. And they're like, no, you should get a Spanish person. I'm like, but no Spanish person will do it for me, even though they say they will, even with yeah. money, no matter what. So it was just kind of like, um, but uh, I don't know. Good I help wish is I... hard to find. Well, I mean, it's it's just it, it it's it's just hard. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's just hard. I mean, it's, yeah. it, the work is hard. Like, it's not it's not like you being a uh, mean person, or whatever. It's just like this this role of content creation is a grind, and people do not realize that. You get ninety percent done, and then there's ninety percent more to do, and then there's ninety percent more to do, and then there's ninety percent uh, packaging, and then ninety percent uh, marketing. Yeah, and you just feel you just want to be done and over with it and quit yeah. every time, every course. Yeah. I mean, what are we trying to do? We're trying to take your expertise, your knowledge of cloud computing, of the certifications, having gone drilled, prepared, passed them, or intentionally failed them. And uh, like like that lived experience, that, that knowledge that's in your head and break it out into hundreds of PowerPoint slides and walk through all the concepts, walk through all the terminology, walk through all the ways that like a certain type of technology is slightly different from others, find the parallels. Like, I mean, your courses, the, the certification prep course, they could be like a dozen hours of just for one certification, right? Um, we just want that expertise and we want everybody to be able to have that yeah. so they can go past this, these exams. They can earn these certifications. They can go out and win in the job market and they can uh, get better jobs, have more opportunity than they would have had without these certifications, right? Like it, it's all a, a means to an end and that end is having families that can afford to put bread on the table. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, uh, back to AI, like AI generation for like, like I like to use little icons to screw stuff up. So it's like, Instead of going to flat icon, I can just be like, hey, give me an SVG icon of something unique. And so uh, I think that uh, that removes some of, yeah. some, of, uh, some of those things before you had to purchase those assets. Um, uh, AI grading. So we, we built out validators originally with the intent to have it AI graded. Um, because when you are trying to evaluate whether people are doing, doing work, it's basically just pull APIs that bring back JSON and say, does it look like they set this thing up? Right. And AI could do that. But the problem was, is that uh, the token, the token window wasn't large enough to analyze the context, the amount, window, yeah. the context window. Sure. As it might be now, but I'd have to go back to it. And so it depends we, on the, the model. But yes. like, I think like GPT four turbo has like a much larger context window. Claude has like a really large context window. Um, you could fit like an entire code base into that. But, you know, like, like small even, code base. but even still, it was like we ended up just having and I just thought about it more. And it was just like. It wasn't hard to write JSON validators that, that, that said, okay, did this show up in the code? And so we do have, like, that was one of the outcomes of the boot camps was, like, we now have validators for everything almost, um, which is exciting. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was another another uh, example of uh, a validation. But when we did the boot camp, uh, we did, we were talking about the AWS boot camp, the yeah, big yeah, one, the 100-hour Tell us just, like, course. for people who've never oh, yeah, heard about this know. AWS boot camp, it's like 95-hour video or something like that. Maybe more than a hundred hours. It's so like it was like a hundred hour video, but like there was more to it than that. Like people went, okay, I can finish this in a hundred hours. And said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This was done over the scope of four to five months. So yes, you're watching the videos, but like whatever you're watching, it's three times the labor. So like you're putting like 300, 400 hours of work. And in fact, today 
I actually have to do this later, but there's somebody that just said, hey, I wasn't part of the boot camp when it ran, but I just finished it all 100%, Andrew. Can you please go grade me and mark it over, even though I'm outside of it? And they did all the work, so I'm going to go after this call. I'm going to go, um, uh, even though it's out of scope, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Yeah, that's um, really chill. So you, go you actually them, look at their work. And, and it, so there uh, yeah. are actual deliverables. There are projects. This is project-oriented learning, right? So, so for that one, what I wanted to do was I wanted to, uh, uh, if anybody got to a certain checkpoint, I would grade them. So we had, I think it was like, what was it? I'm going to go look at the website for the signups because I forget. And it'll, it'll come back to me if I remember. It was Cloud Project Bootcamp. It was cloudprojectbootcamp.com. Uh, we had 10,000 students enrolled, but we yeah. actually had a list of 50,000 backlogged. 50,000 okay. people who wanted to take it who couldn't take it just because... We had to you cut didn't it. have the manpower didn't to have like the grade. capacity. There was actually there was a reason for it, and it had to do, I think, with what was the there was a capacity limit at, at exactly ten thousand. Oh, so like for, originally, what we were going to do was we were going to see if we could have everyone in sandbox accounts, and there was like a hard limit of ten thousand is what we determined based on something like an AWS or something. There was some kind of metric. I can't remember what it was, but there was there was a hard limit of ten thousand. We had, we didn't end up using that system. We we did manual grading. So what I found was that every single week we had people that dropped off because um, it's hard to do something for that period of time at that level of complexity. And that's actually just normal for, um, for, uh, for education. You always expect to lose 40% per week. Yeah. That's a guarantee. I mean, it's like even the best courses of all time on yeah. like Coursera, like uh, Stanford's own like course platform have like two, 3% completion rate. You know, Free so, Code Camp has a very low completion rate, frankly. Uh, a lot of people, uh, their eyes are bigger than their stomachs when it comes to doing hundreds of hours of well, or, or, or they or they get to where they need to get to, right? Like it's not yeah. necessarily oh, yeah, it's, it's 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 just and like working, a happy ending, right? It's like working out. It's like you get you get some kind of a level of skill. But anyway, like when you do it for that long, um, it will down to from like from ten thousand to um, I'd say a thousand near completion with a hundred core people that like really finished it yeah and so um that was fine like that was actually good yeah. numbers uh for for what it was and you know like when you say how are you gonna grade ten thousand people i didn't have to grade ten thousand people i had to grade um thousand people and then a hundred people really well yeah right um and i really enjoyed it uh, i got really fat even though i had lost a lot of weight i lost a lot of weight again i'm losing weight right now again just uh, because in, of the stress of like grading all these people uh, no, 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 no. It's just, I, no, it's just, um, but anyway, it's just, <laughs> well, I mean, you said you got really fat. What do you mean? I, well, because I was here, like right now I'm in standing, but like I was sitting <laughs> all day, every day, taking calls every single day. I didn't have time to prepare good meal, uh, good meals because I yeah. was like, we were making it, we were, we made the course. Like I, sorry, I made the, I, we were making a product, like a, um, a social media platform, a yeah. clone of Twitter. Right. And I didn't plan it ahead. It wasn't like I, it was all stage. It was like, we're building something for real and we'll, we'll have class this week. And then throughout the week, I have to make it. Yeah. Right. So it was like, we had a general idea of what we wanted to build, but it was, it was, um, we say build the bridges as we cross it. Uh, yeah. and it led to a very unique experience that I don't know if I could replicate again because, uh, I didn't make any money off of it. Not that. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So how much did right. the boot camp cost to attend? Not, uh, nothing. It was free. It yeah, was 100% yeah, exactly. Free for, like for for students. So for, you you it, like not free for me. <laughs> not free for you. Did you have sponsors? How did you make no. it work? Uh, we sorry. We had a couple sponsors. So we had uh, like a, a We Cloud Data, which is a um, a school in Toronto. They're mm -hmm. like super nice. Adrian Cantrill, who's my competitor, sp sponsored me. He was very generous. Um, you wouldn't think that he would sponsor. Maybe he's thing. trying to push you in an er early grave, overworking you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> he's no, like, he's, yeah. Oh no, he's a, go he, for no, it, Andrew. Do a lot of these. <laughs> no, he's a good guy. He's, he's like he's, no, like, he's just, a good guy. I'm just joking. I'm sure he's a yeah, good guy. So, I just it was... but um um I, th I thought we had another sponsor, but yeah, it was like there was no. It was at the time where all these layoffs were happening, so people yeah. said they said Andrew, you're going to have the easiest time getting sponsors. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, "We can't get sponsorship for anything." Yeah. Like there's like 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 there's there's events where people have like 500 people and they'll they'll get like two hundred thousand dollars in sponsorship. And yeah. I, I I had sponsorship of like twenty thirty and 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 we we like we out of pocket our company Exam Pro it's like seventy thousand dollars, right? So it wasn't like it was free. It cost me money and 
uh, you know, we, we kind of made it up when we did the Terraform Bootcamp. So we had to do a hybrid thing with the Terraform Bootcamp and it, it kind of it kind of alleviated that. But really like this cost of the bootcamp came from me making all the courses, the free courses that we published the free code camp and people uh, optionally paying for the additional materials, which they don't need to pass. Yeah, and, that, and let's talk about Xampro's business model. I, I definitely want to talk about, uh, you know, your Terraform uh, bootcamp and things like that. And you use the term bootcamp a lot of people think coding boot camp like boot camps have actually existed i think back s since the dot com bubble like mm -hmm. it's it's considered a newer phenomenon but the idea of basically having like something quick to quickly help somebody acclimate to a new field a new category of skills that they're trying to acquire right uh so a boot camp doesn't necessarily need to be like oh i paid twenty thousand dollars and i study for 16 weeks or something like that that's like what it was during the the height of the boot camp craze and like 2014 20 yeah through 20, 2018 maybe that's about right yeah yeah between that uh, range, but yeah. but like exam pro you publish you know huge video courses uh on free code camp dozens of them on pretty much every cloud certification you can imagine like entire ecosystems like all the aws you know categories of certifications and it makes people mad too like other content creators, it makes them mad because they, they, they say um, it's not that problem anymore. But at one point, uh, content creators believed that I was um, uh, uh, running, running everything to the ground because if, if I release the videos for free, then who's going to buy a paid course that's just videos? You have right. to do something additional to and, it. And it turns out people will still pay for – They still like, do? People love spending money. Like well, people still just, use Udemy and, and pay 25 – dollars for a course that they're never going to actually watch because it feels good to buy to walk into a bookstore and buy a book because it feels like you're buying the time to actually read that book people 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 love to like express their intentions and their aspirations through purchasing well it's like a hot dog too right like uh like you want ketchup mustard and relish on and and, and different people bring different perspectives right so that's there's true room, there's well, room yeah. for more than like people think like I'm worried about other competitors. It depends. Like if, if somebody's trying to do exactly the same thing in the exact funnel at the exact time as me, that's a problem. But if we are friends and we coordinate and they're going, and this, a lot of people don't know this, like a lot of the creators in the space, we're all friends. Like a lot of us are friends. Some of us were very antagonistic early on. It was very, very problematic. But a lot of us, like we, like we get out of the way of each other, right? So that we, we both can do well and be, be, we're technical competitors, but we can, we can both do well and, uh, it's usually an issue when there's just like there's some people that are just like they're just they just want to yeah make the most and do everything right and yeah. I I look like that because I do a bit of everything but I don't really cause that much damage in in these areas if I well if I a, say, a lot right? of you doing everything is just because you're intellectually very curious and you love learning about these new technologies and taking these exams like you're like an exam nerd <laughs> or like a certification nerd in the way that like Dawal Shah who runs Class Central is obsessed with massive open online courses from like Stanford and MIT and stuff. Like he eats, sleeps and breathes this. He goes to conferences where he just talks, he's just giddily excited about this. And you give me the same vibe as far as technical certifications. Um, so one thing, one question I have for you, is the way exam pro works, the way that you're able to publish all this content for free on YouTube, on the free code camp channel and still, you know, buy expensive bread to give to your kids uh, and put gas in your car for a two hour road trip. Every time you want to get groceries um, like, like how does exam pro actually work? Like what kind of additional things can people buy on exam pro.co? We like the idea is that we believe that there should be a base level that's free, like the videos so that even if you can't afford anything, you can pass, right? You, yeah. you should, you should be able to fill the gaps yourself. So everything is is like it's it's almost kind of like the the cosmetics of of DLCs and video games or I shouldn't yeah. say that they're they're more useful than that but it's like um, it would be like we always give a free practice exam so that's our our trick to get you to come to the platform is like yeah. we live we always say come to the platform get the free practice exam you go there and then we have downloadables the things are the paid things downloadable slides downloadable cheat sheets um, better better digestible content because we put it on free code camp as the big video and that's intentional because yeah. we want to create a little like just a little bit of friction and if you go to our platform you can watch the videos individualize yeah and um, you can actually there's like a pretty cool like workflow where you like click through and everything's broken out into different like if if, if anybody's ever taken a course on like um 
educative or class classify or something. I can't remember the sure. names of these different platforms, but they're they're basically like you can just pay a fee to like have this and you can put your site on that, but you have all custom and it's much better than those in my experience because you've like gone through and like engineered everything. So you, you, you progress through the different things and you get like stars moving across. If I, if I recall correctly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's like a, an incredibly wholesome, like productive learning environment for people who have a very clear goal. I want to pass the AWS uh, whatever you certified cloud practitioner or the DevOps, one of the harder ones, which, right? Which, whatever is the, yeah, whatever of, of, yeah. The, of the nine or 12, yeah. uh, whichever certification. So, so maybe you could talk about like the, the pricing and like how much it costs. Uh, obviously this is not an ad for exam pro, but I'm oh, yeah, yeah. actually, I'm just curious about these things because I, I want for creators to be able to survive and, and provide for their families. I mean, families this is more just stuff. like this is more just information for other creators. If you're just wondering yeah. how how the the free to watch model works, and maybe you want to do something similar and go on free co camp and make think like how do how can I make free content but also make money? Yeah, right. Because like we're not colluding here or, or doing anything crazy here with free co camp. Anybody can do it. Um, yeah, I mean, we're very selective about whom we'll publish on free co camp. But once you get past that, yes, if you are somebody who is good at what you do, know a lot about what you do. And want to create a course on some esoteric technology, uh, like Cold Fusion <laughs> or or, um, or whatever, you know, right? Like Fortran. We've got a Fortran course, uh, or we've we've got a Cobol course. We don't have a Fortran course. If anybody wants to create one, if you're like some old guard, you know, uh, mainframe person, and you you want to create a course on that, as long as you're good at teaching, yeah, we're we're well, down. And we'll, I, you we'll know, help I, you. And I think the thing is just like finding a means to for me, uh, we can make more videos, right? Because it's just it's it's a silly, but like. Right now, it like, looks like our prices are at 29 USD. I don't control the pricing. That's all. So Baco. that's for like one certification. Yeah, one like course. you basically, it's it's not a monthly not recurring. Is, is no, there, is... no, we don't do subscriptions. So we don't believe. Them. Okay. I mean, maybe one day we'll have them, but like, I like people don't like them because they get charged when they don't want something. Yeah. Right. So like, maybe eventually we'll introduce a subscription, but like we'd make sure that you can opt out of it. And I, there's other competitors in the space um, that. Like I, I was recommending, but then when I signed up their platforms, it, their content, it was a subscription and you still had to pay more. And then like, it was so uh. hard to unsubscribe. I really didn't like it. Like there was in cloud space in particular. And I, like, I, I, literally, I literally yelled at them on Twitter because I wanted my money back because I was trying to recommend them because they had labs, like, like uh, lab systems I didn't have. I don't care if people need education. I want to recommend it to other places. And so these are obviously ways to grow your, your organization. And so, you know, we fundamentally thought, okay, we're just going to charge a single time fee. It does expire after three years, but we assume like the content will be expired yeah. by then anyway. And also you should do it by then. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? It's so, just like a little, little, uh, carrot, like you only have whatever, whatever, you two, know, two years, 11 months. Whatever it is, a year or two years. I don't, again, I don't know what the, I don't know what the parameters are, but it's a year or yeah. three years, but it's, and so the certifications are constantly getting refreshed. Like, yeah. And if people come to us, we're pretty good about like, Oh, I, I you know, I want, I, I was just getting back to you. they like, fine, here you go. We'll just, we're pretty easy. Like even people steal our content. We're pretty uh, laissez faire about it. Like, cause we like, again, everything's soft gated. So it's like, yeah. you know, but, we'll but have... like, don't, don't, if you're listening, don't take, you know, Andrew's hard work and put it on BitTorrent or something like that. Like, you know, 30 bucks, depending on where you live, do you have any sort of need based scholarships or anything like that for uh, people that are like in lower income countries? Have you ever experimented with like purchasing power parity <laughs> we adjustments? Were, we were trying to, like it has to do with the payment gateway, right? And so we were trying really hard to switch our payment gateway and we spent like four or five months doing this. And it's just like the technology is just still really hard to uh, get implemented. So yeah. I don't know, this is like, this again, this is why we're so relaxed about it. But like, you know, I've seen people and they're like in West Africa, they're, you know, like they're dealing with like constant power outages and they can't spend $10 outside, outside their org. Right, like or sorry, the, or their org, their country, not their their country's not an organization. Yeah. They're, uh, maybe one day, but anyway, anyway. Hopefully, um, not. hopefully uh, the countries remain nation states. Come to Exam Pro to corporations. That would be very uh, that'd be very uh, <laughs> shadow example. run. Yeah, but um, but you know, I, I would just say like I've seen people like they take like screenshots of every single thing and made their own like downloadable slides and stuff like that. But like I think that we're like we have a full free prax exam. And all the contents there. So, like, if you want to go take screenshots of all the things, so you have the slides, so you can review them. I don't care, but it's it's another thing if you're uploading them to to torrent sites, right? That's that's another yeah. story. Like, because you're optimizing okay. for other people, right? 
so again, I'm like, there is people that go and they like, they'll take videos and they're like, Hey Andrew, can I go record one of your practice exams on YouTube and review them? I go, sure. I don't care. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm like, I'm that relaxed about it because you know, I, I, I know there's enough there that people are generally going to pay for it. You know what I mean? And the people that I, I don't feel like, like I've seen other people, they've taken my content and they made free eBooks out of them. Yeah. Like, that is kind of like sketchy though. When they're like literally selling stolen content, I think that they, were sell, they weren't selling it. They just were, they're just, they oh, just okay. were studying and they, they, uh, they enriched it and put it in a book format to the point where it's like, I almost wanted to pay them so that we could put it on the marketplace, which just never did. Yeah. Um, and so I just went and they, they were pretty transparent about it. They're like, yeah, I did this and that. And I went, Oh, okay. Other companies would sue, sue, sue you. Out the yeah. nose. But like for me, I was just kind of like, you know what I mean? Cause we, if we're still making like, if I'm still, if I can still afford things, I don't care so much. It's like people pirating video games. Like, you know, you heard about uh, Nintendo, uh, and, and the, the tears of the kingdom where I've never played it, but like the, that one where they were going after, um, uh, the, uh, the emulator, for Nintendo, like Nintendo Switch, because they're worried about it, and so I'm very, I'm very relaxed about it. So until it actually impacts me, I'm, I'm pretty much. Yeah, yeah. You definitely don't like Nintendo is kind of like really damaged their reputation with indie developers by being overly litigious, and you don't want to do that. You want to create like an ecosystem of people who are excited about Exam Pro and recommend it, and you don't want to have like a, a an iron fist as far as people um, trying to use your tools right so uh, but, but yeah yeah but i mean you said it, camp, like that's all built into our you know very permissive open source license you know people can take the free code camp level it's by design but when you're actually creating stuff that's not open source that you're trying to sell there's probably a lot more judgment involved. well i mean it's more like it's the issue is more like when we have schools that take it and they use it and they do do this there's been schools in the states and the uk not even like it's not like weird it's not like and that's just, I just didn't say the word weird. I just mean like countries where uh, they're developing countries and they have a, 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 a inaccessibility to content. Yeah. I have no issues with them. These are organizations that are all about making money. They're in the U.S. and the U.K. And they take my content. They use it in the curriculum. Um, and they try to find ways around it. So, for instance, they're taking the free CoCamp content. And uh, there is internal students there saying, hey, this is Andrew's content. Did, did you pay him or anything? Because they're paying like thousands of like te- like seven to seven thousand to ten thousand dollars to veterans veterans of the u.s at schools using the 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 content that was published on free co camp and so they they told me and i said hey you can't do this you like i said you should i said i, I would say like if you want to use this content pay a licensing fee and we'll even give you more to update up to date content so what they did instead is they took they took that down and they found one of my older udemy courses because i published some on udemy for free which never worked out by the way i just forgot yeah. about them and so they started using content from like six, seven years ago. And they're like, well, it's a Udemy's thing. And, like, and I was like, are you kidding me? And, and these are accredited schools. And so I went to their, their accrediting board and said, hey, look, this is not, they're not, they, they don't know what they're doing. They're just taking content off the internet and then teaching and charging 10,000 to veterans that are subsidized yeah, by and, the U.S. government. Man, veterans are so exploited. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have served in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. military. Uh, and, and other militaries too, but like, once you have that GI Bill money, and, or like, like, there are so many grifters out there trying to separate people from their hard-earned money that the government gives them for their services. Uh, I mean, it's a tale as old as time. Like the uh, the Mustang dealership uh, right next to the uh, the uh, Army Recruitment Center and stuff like that, right? But but with with courses, it's really like. We want people to be spending that money on community colleges and universities and things like that, not on, you know, kind of shoddy vocational training programs that are privately operated. And I'm sure there are good programs too, but it it is definitely like it comes down to the individual school. I think it's frustrating when they're cutting corners. I mean, first of all, free Coke camp. Use free Coke camps curricula. Like our actual curricula is totally chill to use, right? It's open source, it's accessible anywhere. There are lots of Organizations that run free code camp on a local network within like, uh, you know, like prisons, for example, that don't have Internet access. Shout out to Persevere. Um, And there are also a lot of, uh, you know, computer labs in 
places that don't have good internet access, which there are a lot of places like that in the U.S. You know, the the most developed wealthy country in the world, right? But we have really bad internet coverage, and a lot of people will take free code camp. They'll put it in like a computer lab at a school, so people can actually like learn without having high speed internet. Yeah, it's, um, a diff- it's a different story when it's like people where like they don't have power half the time, or they or they have yeah. a lack of access to internet, or it's a different story, right? But Ab- sorry, absolutely, but but like we would be totally chill if people use free code camp in those circumstances, but. You know, Exam Pro, Andrew Brown, and other creators, like, please don't just wholesale take their material and, and sell it. Like, Free Code Camp is designed where you can do that. You can even white label Free Code Camp and pretend it's your own coursework as long as you don't claim you're Free Code Camp. That's technically within the bounds of Free Code Camp's life for the interactive textual curricula, which is all created by me and a whole bunch of other instructional designers and the open source community. But the stuff we publish on YouTube is like everything you publish on YouTube, even though we're publishing it, it's still technically copyright Andrew Brown and exam pro. Right. And, and we want to always make sure that those copyrights are respected by everyone. So, sorry, well, I'm, I'm in this I little mean, public I mean, service again, announcement. It's, it's hard to enforce copyright, but it's just, it's just about being respectful. A lot yeah, of times creators absolutely. are like, I'm a very flexible creator and, and my, you know, my attitude is like, I'm just here to help people. So, Maybe the, the Idibus Bootcamp one, the, uh, the women's cybersecurity had, had ad, uh, adapted that and used it to teach a cloud for people that are getting cybersecurity. I didn't ask for any money. I just said, oh, great, you're going to help more women get into cybersecurity and you need a, a cloud basis? Here you go. Like, I just need to understand yeah, the they, nature they of it, right? They weren't trying to do this surreptitiously, yeah, were they? they were, no, no. It, I, it, like, it, sometimes people do things that they don't ask permission, but it, it, sometimes it's not an issue with me. It's just like, yeah. it really has to do. It's like, are you trying to charge some, do you not have the expertise? Are you trying to charge someone $10,000? You know what I mean? Like for some, and, and it has no outcome for them. And do they even know that it's the content's coming from me? Or are you, yeah. are you misrepresenting the content? So like yeah. my, my goal is like, I, if I could, and like, if I wasn't a for-profit company, like I, I mean, I wish I was a non-profit company. They're just non-profits are, uh, it's hard. I, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, I know it's hard. It's hard, right? And it's unfor- like I'm just not in a place where it's like if I, my house was paid off, if I if I if I, if I didn't have debts or a house and I was like a little bit uh, a little bit better off, I would be a nonprofit. Uh, my my whole curriculum would be even more transparently open course. I'd make it an open book and I would be trying to push it onto places yeah. so that they, there was a base level of that stuff. So we need people who have these skills. And, and speaking of that, like, obviously, we've been talking a lot about, like, the creator economy and, like, the realities of creating content, getting it out, the distribution channel that is, like, YouTube, uh, the distribution channel that is, like, you know, free code camp if you want to look at it that way. Like, I have an email newsletter that has 7 million recipients each week. That is a way that I can help share the work of Andrew Brown and help more people prepare for and earn these certifications, for example. But, like, beyond that kind of, like, creator related stuff. And I'm sure there are a lot of creators listening in the audience for whom this is really excited about. I want to get to the real, um, the real powerful unlock for everybody listening. And that is talking about certifications and for people who want to earn certifications, how they should focus their time. So my first question for you, if I'm a developer in 2024, maybe I've completed a few of the free co camp certifications, which are free that you can just earn by you know, completing the projects and everything like that. And I want to earn some professional certifications from big companies like Amazon or Microsoft. Where do I start? What would you recommend for a basket of certifications that people should focus on if they just want to have the broadest opportunity possible before they really want to specialize? Before you get into certifications, you should have a base knowledge of technical skills. And so some, uh, uh, what, what free code camp delivers with their, uh, their free certifications, the ones that you provide in different technologies will give you a basis of it. If you don't have programming skills, if you don't have networking skills, if you don't have uh, any like OS skills, Linux skills, you you will pass cloud certifications, but you won't be able to do anything. When we did our AWS bootcamp, we had people that held pros, specialties, all the highest levels of cloud certifications. They couldn't use Discord. They couldn't use a Git, uh, like a GitHub account. They could not write code. They could not make diagrams. They could not build anything. They could not communicate properly. And so what I'm saying to you is that cloud certifications, 
require a, another level of base skills that you either have to do prior or during. And so when I make my cloud courses, I throw in a bunch of stuff in there that is not part of the certification, okay? And it will take longer to do and it'll be, be annoying and it'll, it'll take longer to get your goal, but you have to have these skills. And so you either want to obtain those skills first before you do it. Now let's talk about certifications. Certification, like cloud certifications, I, I think the, the approach that is better is to go broad before you go deep, okay? So uh, if you ask everybody else, they'll always say, go deep into like, just pick a cloud and go deep into that. Yeah. And, and the reason I, I say no is because every single cloud has their bias, has their gaps, and um, they just won't have good coverage of the landscape of, of stuff you need to learn. And you, and you basically do need to learn it all. Not all at once, but you need to learn it. Uh, you, need, you need to learn it. So um, Microsoft has a very good approach where they have a bunch of fundamental certifications. So they have their fundamentals, which is just general cloud. Then they have their data fundamentals, their AI fundamentals, their security fundamentals, and there's probably another one. And so that is a great approach because you're getting across, uh, across the board good coverage of your stuff. And then when you have that, then you can go deeper on another cloud. And if you go into AWS, AWS, uh, um, their cloud certification, is, it doesn't have enough coverage. So you could do AWS and then do all the other fundamentals that uh, Microsoft has. The only disadvantage of doing the Microsoft ones is that they're, they're all focused specifically on their products. Yeah. So now you have to go to other clouds to, to fill those gaps. And I, I want to talk about like how those gaps are different. If you are on the Microsoft platform, um, Active Directory, which is a huge staple of the, of the tech industry, is extremely well covered on their platform. Okay, you go to AWS, it's like it doesn't exist. You go to GCP, it's like it doesn't exist. And so that's like one big gap that you will have. If you use, if you're on AWS and you learn about serverless technologies, they're first class over there. They work yeah. excellent. They're, they're just so well interconnected. You go over to Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure, and they are just not the same thing whatsoever. Like you don't use Azure functions to build apps with it. You use it to execute like background jobs for integrated services on the platform. It's, it's like a totally different different thing because they're so underdeveloped. You go over to GCP. Yeah, and GCP, just real quick, Google Cloud, uh, pro, what is it, platform, Google Cloud platform, and AWS Amazon Web Services. Amazon Sorry, Web Services. I didn't mean to interrupt your no, that's flow. Fair. That's, that's fair because they're, they're different. Yeah, the, the initialization there, but like GCP, you go over there, they're really good with data. Like big queries, like, unbelievably great service uh their their ml services are unbelievably unbelievably excellent um and it's just it's just like it's just they're, they're completely different so like people say they're the same and they are to a certain degree but then they're they're different and they'll give you a different aspect of 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 the industry right like uh and when you when you work at places it's it's yes most use a primary cloud provider, but they're going to have a different way of working. So, um, you know, like Microsoft, they're very CLI driven. Like everything is like, when you're learning is like, you're using scripts that are pre-existing, you're using lots of PowerShell, you're using lots of .NET, you're using lots of .Windows servers. If you don't know that ecosystem, you're gonna have a hard time, right? And that's like a big gap as well, not knowing that ecosystem. Like my co-founder, he's really good at that stuff. So I was, I'm always pulling him in for that kind of stuff. So I don't know, it's just, I would just say trying to get as much broad coverage as possible. And, and that's like the opposite advice of a lot of people say, but it's weird because there's an older adage of a T-shaped developer where you go yeah. broad and then you go deep, but people seem to have forgotten that or, or they're, they're just, they're, they're just in their bubble of their bias. Like they're in their, like they're in their right. team and they just want to stick with their team. I mean, I, I guess if I was just like somebody who didn't know a lot about what it was like actually working in tech and I was just like, I'm just going to pick AWS and I'm going to earn every AWS certification. Got to catch them all. And like, yeah, you're like going through, you're learning, uh, you're using exam pro to like cover the fundamentals. And I'm, I'm, uh, relieved to hear that like you cover a lot of stuff that isn't on the exams just because it is stuff that people should know that goes beyond the scope of the exams. But like I could easily see someone just using the official docs and just trying to grind through and earn these certifications and completely not seeing the forest for the trees that these certifications cover very specific, you know, tools that are all, you know, it's, it's like building a castle in the sky, right? Without that foundation there to hold everything up, you, you might as well be like, there, there's that, um, the Chinese room 
paradox, right? It's like a machine learning thing. Like if you're in the room and you have like some book and people are feeding in these Chinese characters and you're looking at the book and you're, you're figuring out what Chinese character follows, what Chinese character, and then you're putting that out. You could technically be like an amazing, you know, Chinese character token predictor, like uh, without ever actually knowing Chinese because you're just following like some instructions, but you don't actually understand what's going on by learning the fundamentals. You, ascend from being a mere, you know, automaton inside of, you know, a, a Chinese character producing room uh, to actually being somebody who knows what they're doing and understands the importance of tools and when to use certain tools in which context and all this stuff. You're a well-rounded developer. You're a T-shaped developer, right? Like you've got that breadth and then you've got that depth in the security space or the network space or whatever area you choose to specialize in, right? So, so I know I'm just recapitulating what you said, but uh, 100%, I think that uh, it, it is absolutely important to get the fundamentals. Okay. Well, so, and, and, and there's other ones like that aren't cloud specific. Like you should know IAC. So like take the Terraform cert as one. Mm -hmm. You should know you should know how to work with uh, version control systems. Take the GitHub Foundation certification. You should know how to do programming. Take the C Sharp certification, right? Yeah, Free Code Camp has a, a free C Sharp certification that we developed in partnership with Microsoft. It uses official Microsoft documentation, and we kind of like curated with them. Um, there's yeah. there's ones that are no sort of like I don't think there's a SQL certification, but it's like go take the the SQL course on Free Code Camp. When we did our boot camp, all all of the prerequisites uh, were Free Code Camp content. It was all 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 Free Code Camp because. We could fill all those gaps there. The only the only challenge with the, like some of the stuff is that again it's not it's not it's not a problem. It's just that people like things when they're packaged in a particular way. So yeah. like a lot of these things, it's like they're great courses. There was like a comp sci course that came out uh, like I think on a recent like covered comp sci, but it's just like for some reason like if it's not packaged a certain way, like if there's not a goalpost at the end, you don't get a, a paper at the end, and and, and there's uh, uh, ways of checking it. People kind of can discredit these things, which which seems really silly to me. Um, and so, you know, like it's not like I'm like crazy about certifications. It's just the fact that it works as a mechanism to get people motivated. Um, and so, you know, if there is a way to break out of that, it'd be nice. But I, I don't think there is. It's just the way humans are. You got to play to 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 how humans think. Yeah, absolutely. The teacher has to meet the learner halfway and empathize with the learner and like all their circumstances if they want to help the learner. Mm -hmm. So just to recapitulate, like, like, I mean, you said, if you want to learn version control, do this certification, let's talk real quick about the GitHub <laughs> certifications because GitHub just published some certifications. Very cool. We've already got a few, uh, we've got at least one course by Andrew Brown on uh free code camp that covers one of these, uh, certifications, the, the foundational certification for GitHub, right? Maybe we can talk, maybe you could just give us some insight into how these certifications were developed, how they were released and the interesting kind of sequence of events that transpired from there that you were personally involved in. You know, it depends on, it depends on the certification. Every family certification, uh, I take a different approach to, uh, for GitHub. I was really excited about it when I heard that they were releasing these certifications because, uh, my primary skills as, as a developer, right? So some people from networking, uh, the it space, I talked about covered the IT space, but developer was it, is my bread and butter. And so GitHub, I already knew inside and out. Like uh, there was no question in my mind that I could produce a course uh, very quickly. And as soon as I saw the outline, um, I literally had every single course, not just the GitHub foundations, every single course broken up in terms of how uh, in terms of how I would record it. And the GitHub foundations I completed in like three four days. And in fact, it would have been done sooner, but there were uh, some uh, delays uh, at, because uh, we're talking about how how to release that course and the timing of it. So so like it was just done instantly, and it's because I could just literally open up GitHub and start recording without having to do any research whatsoever. Um, it was it was the fastest course I ever I think I've ever produced like three four days. Um, but um, uh, the, the the challenge with that course in particular, like people have to understand, like there's it like when courses are engineered, there are legacy reasons as to why they're engineered. So like that GitHub certification, they existed before they, they existed before this happened. Apparently, they existed for like two three years. They were used internally with partners. Okay, this, this is common knowledge. So let's I'm say not, you're I'm not giving like, secrets out here. This is not secrets, but so let's say you're like 
VMware or some yep. other tech company and you're like, we want to get our, uh, some of our engineers certified on your, your stuff, like continuing professional education. Is that what they were used for? It, yeah, I think, I think, I think again, GitHub has to be the one that really speaks to it, but I believe that the, the purpose of it was that they had uh, partners with GitHub and they were incentivized to get these certifications when working in an official capacity with GitHub. And this is kind of like how AWS does it and other ones to be like, AWS has the Amazon Partner Network or AWS Partner Network. And if you want to advance in their network, you have to obtain particular certifications. And they have internal ones and external ones. And there's internal ones that uh, people don't know about, uh, but partners know about that you have to get, like working with AWS. Um, and so GitHub had something similar. Not all organizations do that. Some are doing it for different reasons, but that's how some of these things start out. And so when these ones were engineered at, at GitHub, they were built um, to understand all of the products because they want their uh, their partners to know all their products. Um, and the GitHub one doesn't actually cover a lot of Git as it's focused mostly on the GitHub products, but you're gonna learn Git either way, whether you want to or not, because you have to know it to, to yeah. utilize it. I mean, you have to know Git in 2024, I'm sorry, but like you're gonna have to sit down and learn the weird syntax and the weird, like. Yeah, yeah. still, still. Um, and so, and so, you know, um, you know, when that transitioned as a public thing, I think that there was a legacy team and a new team uh, uh, has taken over. And so I believe that um, where they are right now is transitioning. But when that stuff came out, there was funny pricing around it. Uh, like on Twitter, uh, we, we came out and I made the courses really quickly. But when I went to go register the course, I found it was like really expensive and they were all the same price. Uh, and there was just some key things that were missing. Like there was no uh, domain breakdown. There was... Uh, uh, you didn't know what your score was, but there was all reasons for it, right? And so I had taken guesses and I talked to GitHub and it turns out I was right on 99% of all the reasons why. Um, but it was just that the, it was a legacy product that was transitioning to a new team. Uh, and there, and it was that they just did not have, like they, they a lot like the things that I say out loud or anyone that used to say, uh, say out loud, a lot of times they're thinking about the same, same thing. So when I had voiced those things, they heard them. And they just needed they just needed external validation to change them. And so within weeks, they now have domain breakdowns. I think they were talking about getting the score in. Uh, there was considerations of bringing Git into the, the course. And so, um, you know, a lot of the reasons why courses are the way they are is because of legacy reasons or there's product marketers and they want to get certain things in. And often the people that actually want to do the curriculum development have to compromise and they don't get to exactly do what they want to do. Uh, and again, this is not just GitHub. This is all of them, AWS, HashiCorp, all of them, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, certifications, that's where I, where I say they're not efficient or there's going to be like 30 or 40% crud that's more about like what product yeah. marketers want you to know or like, or it's like PR wanted you to know to, to, to um, Now like, this is like the, the GitHub certifications the or would you say this is, all of this them. typifies all certifications? All like of them. I'd say the ones that, that do it the least is HashiCorp certifications for okay. some weird reason. HashiCorp, like they have, I would say the cleanest uh, certifications I've ever seen where it's like e every single item on the, on, on the exam guide is in the course. So if there's a, if there's a bullet point, you're going to get a question on it and there's no, what are the values of HashiCorp? And, and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like they're yeah. just like, how do you use, they're like, it's Terraform and you got to do a deploy. What's the command? Terraform apply. Okay. Right? So it's very, very uh, practical, practical as opposed right? to, you yeah, know. it's it's very, and, and at first I wasn't sure about that, but I I really like it because because like I can, I know I can go in there I can make the content uh like just go down the list I got good coverage, people aren't stressed out about it you know what I mean it, it has application, but these other ones it's just like it's just that well, there's more people getting involved in them they want to have different kinds of outcomes in them yeah and so some some people take over um. You know, it's just, it's just the nature of it. So if yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So what happened with GitHub? Like you approached them, you, you had all oh, this, yeah. this, oh, yeah. uh, these, I guess, concerns for lack of a better word, like this feedback. Well, well I just um, told them, like I, like I told them, I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this certification. I want it to do well. When it does well, I make money and it lets me make more free courses for every, it helps everybody. Please make these changes. And what I, what I did was, and it wasn't that I would just like said it out loud. Like I, like I went at them because it happened. It was that when I told people the price online on Twitter and LinkedIn, people went, no. And the price was $200 per certification. Like Every certificate, no, no matter what level, even the foundational one. And so, yeah. and so that didn't make sense. So I took like 50 screenshots of people saying like, I'm going to pass on this one. The price doesn't make sense. Why is it like this? And so I, I was, it was more like, 
it was more like I'm bringing the internalized feelings of the community and rolling it up and bringing it to them. And that's usually what I do. Like when I'm yeah. today, I was like giving a hard, eight of us a hard time. Uh, and I give them all a hard time, which is not a great, I, not a good move, but yeah, it, not great for your relationship with them, but I, great I, for the end learners who have to use these certifications. It, right? I, I should say that like, there's people like, like even when I complain about ABS today, there's people in my DMS at AWS and, and, and they, they understand and they're working internally to do their best. But the it's it, like, these organizations are so large. That there's there's good and there's people that are I don't want to say bad but they are uh, they prioritize uh, different things prioritize right? different things and so um, you know like the whole point of being a community member is to be the uh, the check and balance of it but you have to you have to be strategic about it because sometimes complaining out, complaining out loud is not a good strategy and you need to internally work with them and so you have to have a, a system so if I have an internal yeah. process with somebody I'll always do that first. And if, if for whatever reason that's not working, then I will go external. So like when I was complaining about AWS TNC today, I know TNC leaders are reading it. And TNC. I know t training certification, Okay. right? And so it, it's me trying to uh, exert pressure to make changes that's better for everybody and AWS, like and the other partner included, right? But there's a point where sometimes the decision is their decision and you're done, now you're just being a jerk, right? And so you have to you have to walk that line and go okay yeah. I'm, I'm not being somebody that's just uh, uh, trying to get my way versus something that, like it's more of a like that's what they want to do so like sometimes yeah, I mean, you gotta accept, with github yeah. and you know spoiler alert you were able to essentially get them to cut the price of these certifications in well, half i would say i would say that they want they needed to hear it from the community and i just did the legwork for them okay. i didn't i didn't cut the prices but i mean they, putting yourself on the line and, and carrying that and risking them shooting the messenger and being like screw this andrew brown guy he's a rabble rouser right like, well i mean it, it, was, it was low risk at this point because like i didn't have like an established relationship with github internally but i'm just saying that yeah it, it can be like if you're if i I'm, mean it jeopardized potential future relationships yeah, you might have with them right yeah but you know, sometimes like some like it just depends on the attitude. Some people some people are cool with it, right? Or yeah. there are there's like it's like if I had a bad relationship with HashiCorp, now one of my friends works there and, and they did the they did the legwork and said, No, Andrew Brown is is here to help and he's gonna help you. You just gotta you gotta just work this way and then we'll get this great outcome, right? Yeah. Like whatever organization. And so um it, it's kinda like that. And it's it's hard because you gotta understand like I'm not here to promote these these companies. I'm here to promote the community and so I'm trying to work with these organizations, but at, at the same time, it's like at the end of the day, these companies are money driven, right? So yeah, I, I mean, they have to not the people, but like the organization as a whole. And they so have to you, grow. They have they investors, have right? Right. <laughs> They're so, on that bus that can't go below fifty miles an hour. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, the the improvements that they were able to make thanks to the feedback. Oh, I mean, you gave I think to the I, they almost took almost all the feedback that and, and it, the things that they couldn't do. It's like it was more like. We have to work on this over time. So again, like they got the domains in. So in the video, you'll see in the video, I go, they didn't do domains. I think they should do domains. They have those in now. They're nice. in there, right? Um, I think they might show the uh, the exam uh, the the uh, the exam uh, the exam score. The, there was like key missing content about the exam that you needed to know to take it. They filled that out. So like that was where that's an example of um, a certification team that is extremely receptive. Uh, and and trying to do the best outcome for their certifications, right? Awesome. You know? Yeah, so, it's hard. It's heartening to hear this. And I just want to emphasize that, like, ultimately, your interests and their interests are aligned. Even though they're trying to make money, you're trying to, you know, ultimately make money in a way. But the way you make money is by helping people prepare for these certifications, and ultimately get these certifications and have downstream like success as a result of having earn these certifications and actually understanding the skills and having like, I guess is like preparing for a certification is not like, it's not like sitting around and playing Tetris attack all day and having fun. Right. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah. And, and money. so, so like kind of smoothing out their learning curve and, and just making things as clear as possible. So really you're an advocate for the learner is how I look at you. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I, I think I, I would be a developer advocate. Like if I wasn't doing this, I, I'd be, I'd probably do an okay developer advocate at one of these organizations. But, um, uh, you know, coming back to that point on, um, uh, you know, like advocating for stuff, it's like, if I, if like when I, when, oh, I was so excited about GitHub, I, I made so much hype on that. Like so many people, even if, even if the cost was $200, they all like, actually when that cost dropped and we, we promoted it, so many people signed up and were like, I'm taking this certification now. 
And so I feel an obligation to make sure that I, I deliver the content, that it, it is quality content, that's reasonable to pass, that, it, that, that we're setting like, good expectations of the outcome. Because if I tell someone to go get a certification and they go get it and now they're out of money and now they can't pay their bills, I feel really bad about it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a big concern. And like, even like the courses that come out for the AWS refresh that I'm doing, the big ones that everyone's been waiting for forever. Um, like I'm going to be having like a large disclaimer in the beginning explaining like, hey, there's going to be gaps in knowledge. You need to fill these out. Go look at other free code camp courses that will have them. And I will package as much as I can in here, but I can't. I can't put the whole sun in here. You know what I mean? I can't. Well, the thing that like the theme running through, you know, your communication with these certification providers and the, the work that you do to try to prepare learners uh, and set expectations reasonably. You're not like some hype man that's out like this certification is going to change your life. You're like, this is one of many things that you're going to need to do if you want to have a successful career over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Right. Like you're, you're very, um, just down to earth and like you don't want to hype things up. Like uh, you don't want to over promise and under deliver. Well, I just don't, I don't want people to end up in a spot. Like it's like we had a, we had somebody that was like in Canada that was like, Hey, I, I want to become a solution architect and I'm paying $7,000 to take a, a certification boot camp, And I'm going to, I'm going to get these five certifications. Right. And they just passed their cloud petitioner. They paid like a thousand, like, so that means like a thousand to thousand five hundred dollars just to do cloud petitioner, which makes no sense to me. We have it for free, and it's even more 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 robust than any course out there on, on free code camp. And and they're going, I'm going to become a solution architect in nine months. And I said, you're going to get the most senior senior role possible in the in the cloud industry in nine months. That's only given to people that have already worked for years. And you think you're going to get that? And that's that's the promise that that's the overselling that people have. And I'm I say, and yeah. I say to them, I'm like, you should plan for three years. You should have all these adjacent skills and you should assume you should have a backup plan because if, if you're burning through all your money, you're going to be in a bad spot. It's not that it's impossible for it to happen. It's just that you need to, you need to hedge your bets and, and put, put yourself in the best position. Yeah. And it's not like if we're in 2016 and 2018, like 2016 is probably better to say, but 2016, you got a cert. That was a different story because at the time, everybody was very curious about cloud and they didn't know much about it. And you could just say that you had a certification or, or were going to go sit one. And I was like this, I was in Toronto and like there was like big FinTech, fintech banks that said, oh, uh, uh, you, yeah, you have your associate and you're going for your pro. Can you come in and, and interview? And like, uh, and then like you'd be doing whiteboarding and they'd be like, okay, because they just had no domain knowledge whatsoever. And it wasn't that it was hard. It was just like they had no confidence in it. That time is over. And it's with everything. Like now, you know what the new thing is, is like, how are you gonna utilize AI ML, like, uh, like large language models or ML and stuff like that. And so that's the new thing that people are going. And at one point it was like data. It was like, oh, data, everything's data driven. Now everything's yeah, like AI driven. Yeah, the new oil. <laughs> and so, and so um, you know, I think that uh, like, it's just the, the cloud industry has matured like anything else. And it's not like it's becoming devalued. Like. People like people still need people to build websites. That yeah. hasn't changed. I mean, it's right? just layers, right? Like there's still web development and there's people are still running know, Moodle cloud engineering and then there's, there's, there's ML on top. You know, WordPress, Moodle, Joomla. Those things are still running. Okay, Joomla, people still need. That's still, a throwback. Yeah. People are still using them. There's a whole community around them. Like yeah, I mean, uh, like I said earlier, Fortran. I joked like, oh, get some. There are mainframes running at like you know state governments. You know, employment office things a, like that, that that still use these old tools there, because you get the system running. You don't want to just scrap it and build a new one, right? There was a kid that got like a like an old supercomputer. It was it like it wasn't old. It was like old by like seven year standard, and he set it up in his his house. His parents helped him buy it, and it's like an old IBM one. And he had learned Fortran on it or something. That's so and cool. Then, and he wanted to see the the ones that they had at IBM, so IBM invited him over and he got to see them. And they ended up hiring him. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> you, know what, yeah. you know what I mean? Like. It doesn't matter. Like there was, I think there's like, but you, you, there is a smaller pool, right? Like there's one person that still does, um, um, was it Cold Fusion, right? There's a, yeah. there's a woman out there that does Cold Fusion, and there's still work for it. But the thing is, is that, you know, you have to want to do that, um, and and be passionate about it, and and I, I think there's opportunities there, and yeah. I just wish that people would just keep running with it, and that's the problem. They just they want to really make money and I, I get it. I, I understand why. Yeah. But, but like in the race to make money, like, I mean, 
generally, like you need a lot fewer skills to do Joomla development or WordPress development than you do to be like a machine learning engineer. Uh, I mean, a lot of those people have PhDs and a lot of those people have, you know, a decade or more experience working as a Python developer, you know, uh, doing like just backend development or something like that. Right. Uh, a lot of people have domain expertise. Uh, you can absolutely do that. You could become a machine learning engineer by the time you are in your mid twenties. If you, if you do everything right and stuff like that, I know machine learning engineers who are in their mid twenties, but it's a lot harder to do that. Um, and I think a lot of people are seeing the machine learning engineers in their twenties and thinking, Oh, I can do that too. If I pay this person $10,000 to do their machine learning boot camp or whatever, like that, like there, there will be people out there who will happily accept your money I, I, to over promise, you know, I, what your the miles you're going to get. I don't have a problem with people charging $10,000 if it has an outcome, if it has the guarantee, like if you know yeah. what you're paying for. Right. But it's like, like when you go to a school, like a credit school, at least in Canada, there is like, you, you have your student union, you have particular rights that have to be enforced, curriculums have to be developed a certain yeah. way. Uh, they're supposed to have like, uh, like, like on campus stuff and other resources. Now, it, whether the education is failing in terms of the quality, uh, quality of the materials is a different story, but you're paying for that infrastructure around it for a guarantee. Um, though Canada has been having a bit of issues because they've been um, getting in trouble for not having uh, the proper outcomes as of recent. Mm -hmm. So, well, I mean, the U.S. same thing. Like there, same thing. Yeah. Five thousand universities or colleges in the United States, but I mean, come on, like how many of those are actually like? a college that you would be like really proud to have graduated but, from. Well, in Canada, the, the, the best school is Waterloo comp, comp side mm -hmm. Waterloo. Yeah, you go to, or school. university of Toronto is very good, but like you go to Waterloo, you'll, you'll like, you will get a job no matter what you'll get a job because they've, they've done such a good job making sure that students have an outcome. The curl up students get paid, right? They like, you get a 90, if you get 99%, you can still fail. You know what I mean? Like they have a, they set a really high bar. Um, and uh, employers know what they're getting, right? And so they had that loop, but most schools don't do that. They're just like, you pay, and then you got to go get the job yourself. And uh, you, you know what I mean? Like they, they might have some kind of network, but it's not as, as robust as, as it is. But I'm just saying, like, if you pay $10,000 or whatever it is to go to Waterloo, it's worth the money, right? If you get in the right time and you have the money, but it's, it's these other issues where it's like $10,000 and it was all it was all vapor to begin with um but you know again it's i just want people to make sure that they're getting what they want out out of their money or no if they have no money yeah. you know whatever it is right so absolutely yeah and and that's like the name of the game is like under promising over delivering optimizing for having a reputation which is something you've been investing in for so long uh through everything you've been doing with exam pro and everything you've personally been doing to advocate for learners just building up that reputation for I'm not going to screw you. You can trust me that like I'm going to say the reality and not overhype things, right? Um, and yeah. that's what I wanted to talk about because there, like, there's like I, I really need more bread though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like literally, <laughs> literally. <laughs> well, by optimizing for the long term, right? Like that is the name of the game, right? Optimizing for the next few decades. People are still probably going to be taking professional certifications decades from now. People are definitely going to still be working as developers, regardless of what Jensen Huang, uh, CEO there, of NVIDIA I mean, is I mean, or, or if it's their, or if it's, it's their AI bot that has to go through my certifications, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll just be a few API calls and the certification will be earned. No, uh, I don't believe that that's going to come to pass anytime soon. So, no. uh, But uh, just a quick correction. There are 3,931 Title four degree granting institutions in the United States. So it's not 5,000. It's contracted a little bit, which is probably for the better, frankly. It's, it's I don't think we lot. need 5,000 institutions in the United States. But um, what I wanted to say is um, you and I both grew up watching a TV show that's essentially advocates for that value of like optimizing for the long term, following prime directives and not, you know, corrupting civilizations with technology too soon Not golden like, girls golden girls right yeah oh yeah golden girls that was the show we watched no we, we you may have watched that i have never seen an episode of golden girls i'm sorry to say for all the golden girls maybe i'll check it i've heard good things but star trek so we, we've talked about so much we've talked for more than two hours but i do want to the obligatory let's talk about star trek because um you and and andrew your co-founder 
he's got this giant poster. It's like a blueprint of. Uh, oh yeah, he's, yeah, he's a, yeah, like uh, yeah. of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit because I, I do imagine there are a lot of Trekkies in the audience, people who love Star Trek, and I love Star Trek because it's got a humanist message. I love it because it has intelligent plots and intelligent interactions. People are polite. They're civil. They get things done. They're practical, but at the same time, they have values. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my role model was Captain Picard because he always seemed to, like, have this high-minded, like, approach to, like, solving problems. And often he'd be presented with an easy way, and he'd be like, wait, there might be a better way that's not as easy. Let's see if we can find that. He didn't stop merely at the easy way. Um, Maybe you can talk a little bit about your relationship with Star Trek over the years. I mean, Star Trek does set really good uh, moral values. Uh, uh, and I, I think that's the aspect there is that you have this um, uh, uh, community or, or uh, uh, I don't know what the word is that I'm trying to look for, but the idea is that you have all these people uh, where they're not worried about money. They're, they're, they're trying scarcity. to- scarcity post they have a post scarcity uh, scarcity mindset and so that they can uh do good do good however they they see fit um and i and i think the thing is like holding up uh your sense of um more like i keep saying morals but the idea like ethics right like so you know like captain picard or all these other people have um uh moral ethics about you know what it is that they want to do, it and, and and the betterment of the world, and they're not thinking thinking about the uh, the materialistic things to uh, to show the betterment uh, of folks. And I, to me, like that is just, you know, if you, if you can live up to that, that that is amazing, right? And you know, I I want to I want to get to that point at some point. And so the idea of like producing free content around the world, and and having everyone upskill is is that lift up. Uh, you know, th- th- at least that's what I think. And so, I don't know. I think there's a lot of ties there, if that makes sense. So you, you see some, some of your role as Andrew Brown, founder of exampro.co, like facilitating that kind of path toward a post-scarcity utopia, really. And it's not a utopia in the sense that, you know, everything's solved and people just hang out all day. People actually work really hard in Star Trek. <laughs> And they still have regimented work schedules and everybody still follows they, a strict dress code and all that stuff. Yeah, they want to work, right? They want to work. They want to get things done. They want to push forward the frontier of human understanding by exploration. It's not, a, by, it's not about going to work so you can make as much money as you can to buy things when you go home uh, or go on trips, right? Like It's like you want to actually do things that matter. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people do want to do things that matter, but like when they get into the workforce and it's a different story than, and, and then also just the nature of businesses. Um, you know, that's, I think that's the, the hard part, you know? So, yeah, I mean, you and I talked about game development earlier, like game development is a terrible field to go into. Don't go into game development unless you're going to be like an indie. Like I hear horror stories about people that worked at Blizzard and companies like that. Right. Um, and yet like think of how many creative, passionate people who love developing games who are instead, you know, working as like database administrators or, um, you know, software engineers at like SaaS tech companies, cause that's where the money is. And, and they would love, they're, they're even hoping to like put away a lot of money so they can eventually go and develop games. Right. Just imagine if everybody who wanted to be a game developer could be a game developer and money wasn't like an objective or it wasn't a consideration. Right. Well, I mean, I think a lot of them, it wasn't like you look at, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, but it's the creator of fallout, the original series. Mm-hmm. He has a YouTube channel. He's that would be really good interview. I'd love to hear. Okay. Interview that. <laughs> he's on, he's on YouTube. Um, I just can't remember his name for some reason, but, um, uh, like he talks about like how, like it reminds me of when I got into tech, which is like the idea, like the reason, of course I was a bit strategic that I didn't go into game development because I needed, I know I had to make some money. But the idea of working with like a passionate team and everyone's excited about working on this thing and, and moving towards a common goal is like super exciting. And that was like my huge draw for startups because like you fix computers, it's like computer in, computer out. You know what I mean? I don't want to do that forever. Um, but like the idea of building some kind of big product that is bigger than than, uh, than all of us together and it's going to be the betterment for everybody. Uh, there's like a funny scene in, in um, Silicon Valley where they're, they're at uh, uh, the startup like like the tech crunch or something and they're all pitching their startup, products tech startup disrupt tech. i actually pitched yeah. there I, oh, yeah? I went to their big hackathon and i was the first out of 
three hundred fifty people that were presenting. But, I had to be but, on the stage first. But, but every product is like lo, they're like we're trying to be low socal and yeah, they're local, trying, like, mobile. Like you trying know. to help, trying to help people. It's going to better the world. And like that was kind of like the like the reason I really got into startups. That I, like, uh, but it's just the fact that um, there's that component. But anyway, he was talking about the video game industry and like he's like you can get paid to make video games. And they like they're obviously being exploited, and they didn't mind because they all they wanted to do was all day, every day, work on video games like a workaholic. And that's like how, kind of like how I am, where it's like you can make you can make money doing this. You can make um, money teaching people how to code. And it wasn't like I was trying to make millions. I was just like the idea is like you make something, and then you know you can kind of do whatever you want. Or or like I met like a lot of early startups where they like, they had their their dot com startup that did really well, and so now they're kind of reliving their dreams as angel investors. And then like, we, we would go and hang out with them and, and they were like really good mentors. But unfortunately, again, it's just the nature of where things, where things go. Um, which is like, can we have that without the whole, uh, uh greed component in there? I don't know how that works. But yeah. I mean, like, I think it's just necessary. Like everybody wants to make a return. I, I used to think like, Oh man, there's like something fundamentally flawed. Like, Capitalism is just racing us toward this this outcome, and and that may be the case. But in general, if you have money and you want to make a return on it, you need to invest money in things that are, are going to grow. And if a company is not growing, then why would you put your money there? Because you, you have to make just inflation, right? Inflation is normally about two to three percent in the United States, so you have to make at least two to three percent, or else you're losing money every year. And like, what if you're a big pension fund, like CalPERS, the big California pension fund? You have to find mm. enough places that you can put money to get growth so that you can continue to compound. App apparently, uh, inflammation, uh, inflammation, Inf <laughs> Infl infl uh, uh, inflation. That's my trick for losing weight, but I get inflammation <laughs> for, for months. I'm not joking. I get inflammation for months and I lose a bunch of weight. It's the best, uh, uh, best way to lose weight. But anyway, uh, inflation, like I was watching a video about like Japan and how they had infl infl uh, deflation. Well, they just had no inflation for for uh, for many years, and they were talking about like you want to have gradual inflation because yeah. uh, it stimulates spend or something. Like it was important. They're like, it's good. You have to have a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you do want some inflation. You, like the main reason bit. you want inflation is because deflation is incredibly catastrophic. If you ever get into a, a state of deflation, nobody's spending any money because like, why would you spend money? You just hoard your money because your mm. money's going to be worth more tomorrow than it is today. So why would you spend it today? And as a, as a result, everybody hoards their money and the economy just grinds to a halt. So you don't want deflation, but you want some amount of inflation just to ensure that there's a buffer between, you know, not, not going into the deflationary territory because it's so catastrophic. But sorry, you, yeah, the, Japan is a very interesting economy to study. If anybody out there likes studying about economics and stuff, like the, the They're fiscal really policy. They're really interesting. Like yeah. every experiment they do is like they've had so many weird economic experiments. It's so interesting, right? Yeah. But sorry, you were talking about um, – how did we get on that? We were talking about um, – so if we, if we go back to Star Trek, <laughs> which is really really want to talk about. Sure, why not? Yeah, like, like how would you be different if, you had, if Star Trek had never existed? Do you think it opened some perspectives uh, – it, do you think it spurred your imagination? I, I think maybe, I'd like maybe I'd be more opportunistic, and I, I would be less focused on like community involvement. Like I think the reason I'm so involved in community involvement is because it was mandatory. Because my uh, my grandfather, who was uh, he, like he was like my mom just won an award in the province for volunteering, and my my grandfather uh, did a lot of volunteering in Thunder Bay. Like like he ran uh, the hockey for the kids in the entire town, the, the soccer, he ran like, uh, the bingo halls that did all his volunteer work for kids. Uh, uh, and, um, I guess it was just because like, he was a, like a veteran from world war two and he had like terrible upbringing, right? His dad died when he was young because, uh, um, he, his dad was a, uh, mortician or whatever the, you know, the person that handles the dead people. Yeah. So his dad died when he was young. So he was like really poor. And then, uh, you know, like he went to war and they thought he died and they spent all his money. So he came back, he had to work harder at, like at the mill or whatever. And so, you know, these, uh, the greatest generation having such a hard time, I feel like they did a lot more for their, their community because of, uh, the hard times that they had. Yeah. And so that part, like I spent so much time with my grandparents that, uh, it just became something that you're supposed to do. Like, you don't even think about like, why are you doing this? There's no money. And it's like, yeah. what do you mean? You're, 
you do this because it's good for everybody, right? Like it wasn't, it was never a thought of like, like, why wouldn't you do this? And it's like, then you have Star Trek, which is also enforcing that thing of like, why are you, why are you working for money? Yeah. Like, why are you doing that? That makes no sense. That doesn't better anybody. So yeah, they even have the Ferengi who are this alien species that is focused on wealth and like accumulation of wealth. And it's supposed to model like the 20th century humans well, in the 24th century. And that's not to say like, I don't think about money at all. Like I have to, because yeah. there's a bare minimum, which is very frustrating. I, I hate it, but it, you know, it's some, but I go, I need to make money so I can do the things that I want to do, which is to do, you know, better things. Um, you know, and again, like if, if, if for long term, right. So yeah, you, unfortunately it's still a thing that you have to do, but like, it's, it's like getting to a point where I don't have to do it, which is, yeah. which is really, I'm sure I, I mean, I know that. so everybody many teachers, that. Uh, teachers, social workers, other people who are frankly like greatly undervalued by society in terms of their compensation, but they love the work. They they know the work needs to be done. They want to do it even at personal sacrifice. Um, yeah. Well, I want to close with this question about Star Trek because I love Star Trek so much. And uh, have you watched all of Star Trek? Of like, have you watched like every single series? Yep. You've even watched like the new ones, like the Picard. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Who is your favorite captain? Who who do you think best exemplifies the values of like, you know, Starfleet and uh I mean Picard probably, but I mean like my favorite captain is Cisco. I uh, I really like Captain Cisco from Deep Space 9. Yeah. What just what do you like a, about him? I th I think he's more of a pragmatist, so like like he like Deep Space 9 takes place on a um uh the, the frontier uh, a frontier where it's on, uh, like on the out like the outskirts of the federation and so their values are being tested all the time right um and i think that that's really interesting to say okay you have this utopian but what how do you deal with it when you're you're dealing with people that don't have all the benefits and yeah. the things that you have and, and how are you going to meet in the middle and uh and, and how are you going to like where are you going to compromise in terms of your moral values and and i think that that captain uh handles it in a very uh, a, a very interesting way and we get uh very interesting uh storylines uh, yeah like there. kind of real politic yeah because prosperity is not evenly distributed I and mean, we talk about the post-scarcity but that's really human civilizations vulcans and a few other uh a few other races have like that level of prosperity but you you do have people that are suffering quite a bit and uh you know starfleet can't help everybody right the federation can't help everybody they have to make these kind of tactical decisions and also the deep space nine there is like a diplomatic kind of show like you've got the warring factions that are kind of constantly encroaching on one another's space and getting into territorial disputes and things like that too so but yeah i mean again like i'd say yeah cisco's my favorite captain but if, if we're talking about the ideals picard picard always is uh is the one there that i think that uh upholds it the best yeah, and some people may even see Picard's boring because he's he's too two dimensional because he just has these uh, very specific like you can almost always predict what Picard's going to do given a certain cer situation if you've watched some Star Trek because he he is a very uh, I mean he does grow and progress as as a human uh, and he's constantly reading constantly learning he lover of history but. At the same time, you know that, like, at the end of the day, he's going to take the most high-minded approach, and he's not going to compromise his ideals. And, yeah, that, that can make him less exciting than watching somebody who's much more dynamic than Cisco. Yeah. Uh, and then it, if somebody just wanted to watch, like, one Star Trek show to, like, like they've never watched Star Trek before, you want to get somebody, like, eased into the Star Trek universe, what would you recommend they start with? I mean, I have a very particular favorite episode of Star Trek. My favorite episode is Duet from uh, Deep Space Nine season one. Season one's not a very good season, but that's an excellent episode. Um, and uh, this very, I was actually, like, n no one ever talked about this episode for years, but then a few years ago, I think uh, it gained some popularity because someone in, um, I think it's Star Trek Discovery was like, hey, I really like this episode. I think this was, was fantastic. But this specific episode is about um, uh, Kira Norris and, there, uh, for those who don't know, like uh, Bajor, <laughs> Bajor, yeah, we're going here. Bajor <laughs> is a is a, um, a a world that was uh, occupied by the Cardassians for years, and the Cardassians uh, 
uh, and basically enslaved them and had them strip mine their own planet, taking all of their resources. And then uh, the Cardassians uh, were in a war with the Federation and wasted a lot of resources. And then they decided that uh, the war was over. They were having a peace with the Federation. And they decided that they're going to uh, leave Bajor and put it back in the Bajor and people because they've taken all that they've wanted. Um, and so uh, Bajor has a lot of animosity towards um, the Cardassians for their treatment. And so in this episode, uh, Kira Norris sees that there is a ship coming through to the station and it has a very specific Cardassian that was known for running labor camps on Bajor. And so they want to, they want to bring him in for war crimes, even though, the, but the Cardassians say there was no war because they were just occupied, yeah, right? Like historical yeah. revisionism, essentially. And so, yeah. And so, and so this fellow here, well, I, I'll end up, I'll, like I'll end up ruining yeah, it. Don't, if I don't tell spoil you. it. But the point That's is, is that it's it's about it's about this, and it changes her mindset. And it's the fact that it's about the I, what I like about this episode. It challenges uh, like your your preconceptions about people, um, and that's what I like. It's like when you have those those kind of moments. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's my favorite episode. But there's a lot of good episodes uh, out there. Um, but uh, a lot of people like uh, what's the one? It's like. Uh, the light or um it's it's the one the where inner the, light inner light yeah people the inner light's very good um there's that one uh there's another really good ds9 one which is, like it's uh dancing the moonlight moonlight something i, I don't know why i can't recall Pell right now but, or something like that yeah. well there, anyway but yeah i if there was one that i'd start with is duet i think it's the best one that's that for me anyway for me in the pale what? moonlight in the pale oh but the pale that's, moonlight's really good so so i haven't gotten that far in deep space nine uh, I, I'm on like season four, or season five. I've just been gradually working through it through adulthood, so I haven't gotten there because I'm I'm like I've heard it's so hyped up. I don't know what will happen. Uh, have you have you heard have you heard the Greatest Generation podcast? Huh. The great the, there's these two fellows in in the the U S. and they it's called the Greatest Generation, and they watch every single episode of Star Trek and they do a podcast on it. But they oh they wait have the, I have one I have, they have heard their own it, bit. but I heard it like way back when it first started and I'm like so, yeah I think I've they seen finished, all these old... I think they finished everything and now they're doing uh they said they'd never do Babylon Five and now they're doing Babylon Five which we know Baco and I love Babylon Five that's another good series yeah. but yeah very heavy diplomacy focused very these five heavy, different heavy. alien races that have to like essentially coincide and stuff yeah man. I could talk all day about this. Uh, so shout out to Duet, which is in season one of Deep Space Nine. You don't have to be very deep into Deep Space Nine. No, you watch the first eight episodes and bam, one of the greatest episodes of Star Trek ever right there. I, I fondly remember that episode. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess parting wisdom for the community. Be sure to check out some of Andrew's awesome courses and uh, note that if you hear AI voice, it's not just because if he's you busy can even he's tell, lazy, if, but it's to you protect his actual voice. Yeah, if you can tell. But, you know, like, again, most – if it's, like, my core courses, it's going to be me. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's just some – they'll never get made unless we use that AI voice, so. Yeah. Well, hey, Andrew, I know that you and I talk all the time. We're constantly corresponding about upcoming courses that you're developing. But I just want to thank you right here on the podcast. I want to thank you again for everything you're doing, not just for the developer community through – developing these amazing courses, which you're publishing for free on the Free Code Camp community YouTube channel, but also for the advocacy work you're doing for people who are earning these certifications, like taking your insights and sharing them with AWS, sharing them with GitHub, trying to get these certifications to be improved, right? Risking your own reputation that some manager is going to shoot the messenger because you really do want these certifications to be good. You want them to be representative of what people want to learn. And obviously, there are so many things you could do to probably improve your own personal situation uh, financially. You've got all these incredible skills. Uh, you've worked as a CTO. You've run consultancies. You've done all these things. And yet, you're choosing to continue to help more people earn these certifications. And for that, I commend you, sir. I really appreciate everything you're doing. And I think the community appreciates it. And all the people who've listened to this, who are going to go out and earn professional certifications. I hope you all uh, keep sharing the enthusiasm for learning, education, uh, working us toward that post-scarcity 
civilization that will hopefully be there for our great, great, great grandkids, maybe sooner. Um, yeah. Thank you again. Yeah, and you know, I, I just want to say that if there's any companies that are watching this and they want to sponsor a, a certification course, they can absolutely reach out to free code camp and, and make that opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of courses that I want to create, but I just, there's, there's no, there's no money in it, but I want to make them right. Like, yeah. and, and I, and, and you, if you, if you want them made, go talk to free code camp and you know, maybe I'll go make it and I make them pretty quick and pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. 100% seconded. So, uh, reach out to me, reach out to Andrew. I'll put a lot of stuff in the show notes. And again, I hope you all have a fantastic week until next week. Happy coding. <laughs>